First tanks and now submarines. Putin can't seem to keep hold of his weapons, with Russia's only aircraft carrier catching fire not once, not twice, but three times since 2018, and his guided missile cruiser the Moskva sinking in 2022, Russia's navy, widely considered one of the most powerful in the world, has seen better days. And now, Russia's submarine power is under serious threat. Here's why. It's no secret that things haven't been going well for Russia, from crushing sanctions to staggering military casualties. Putin's invasion of Ukraine has backfired in a host of unexpected ways. It has also highlighted profound weaknesses in Russia's military capabilities, exposing them as aging, corrupt, and poorly led. Nowhere is this more true than at sea. Despite statements by former Russian President Dmitry Medvedev back in 2009 that, without a navy, Russia does not have a future as a state, the country's surface fleet remains embarrassingly inept. Former US Navy Admiral James G. Foggo recently noted that it has been allowed to atrophy due to factors like poor maintenance, low funding, and corruption. This trend has been on full display during recent years, with the Russian Navy suffering a number of embarrassing high-profile mishaps. Its only aircraft carrier, the Admiral Kuznetsov, nicknamed the unluckiest ship in the world, has caught fire at least three times since 2018. Earlier this year, Ukrainian intelligence assessed that the ship is in critical condition and not capable of moving under its own power. That's not to mention the sinking of Russia's Black Sea flagship, the Moskva, in April 2022. But now there's an even bigger problem for Putin, one deep below the waves. For all the issues with its surface fleet, Russia's current fleet of 58 submarines have been long considered among the most powerful in the world. This includes 11 nuclear-powered ballistic missile subs, 17 nuclear-powered attack subs, and 9 nuclear-powered cruise missile subs, with several more on the way next year. While they haven't been a factor in Ukraine, they are still considered a critical threat by the US military. However, their power may not last forever. Recent reports suggest that Russia's submarine capabilities are being seriously harmed by the backlash to its invasion, especially through the crippling effect of Western sanctions. So what does that mean for the future of the Russian military? And just how serious of a blow could it be to Putin's war machine? To understand just how critical Putin's submarine problem could be, we first need to take a quick look at some Russian naval history, which, funnily enough, is permeated with continuing and humiliating losses of fleets. But wait, there's a plot twist, and it occurs just after World War II. Russia has had military power at sea in one form or another since 1696, when Peter the Great first established the Imperial Russian Navy. Impressed by his visits to Western Europe, Peter realized that Russia could never be a true great power while remaining landlocked. By 1710, he had over 58 ships in his fleet, and despite some defeats, by Peter's death in 1725, Russia was the dominant sea power in the Baltic. During the reign of Catherine the Great, the empire's ambitions at sea had grown, establishing a new Black Sea fleet and annexing Crimea for the first time in 1783. By the time of her death in 1796, Russia possessed the world's largest navy after Britain. This period was the height of Russia's imperial naval power. As naval historian Robert A. Theobald once put it, to my mind, the death of Catherine marks the high watermark in Russian naval history. From this date to the end of the imperial navy, it was on a treadmill working hard, but getting nowhere. This became obvious during the Crimean War of 1853 to 1856, where Russia suffered a stinging defeat to the combined forces of the Ottomans, France, and Britain. The shortcomings of the Imperial Navy were even more obvious by the time of the 1904-1905 Russo-Japanese War. But it gets worse. In response to Russian expansionism in the Far East, the newly industrialized Japanese military gave Russian Tsar Nicholas II a humiliating defeat at sea. The war marked Japan's emergence as a great power and contributed heavily to the First Russian Revolution of 1905. Following the Second Revolution in 1917, what remained of the old Imperial Navy came under control of the Soviet Union. And while Lenin and Stalin both aimed to rebuild a powerful Soviet Navy, it remained largely inept throughout both world wars and into the early 1950s. As Theobald described it in his well-known 1953 presentation at the US Naval War College, this is the history of a navy which has lost more complete fleets than any other navy in the world. 
It is the history of a navy which has never been more than second-rate, that has never been decisive in world history, and that has never developed a depth of tradition to compare with those of the Western navies. But this would change drastically only a few years after his assessment, mainly due to one factor – modern submarines. While Russia had some early submarines before World War II, the first modern Soviet ballistic missile submarines were completed in the late 1950s. These early Soviet models were diesel-electric and based on designs pioneered by the Germans, similar to the United States. However, by 1960, the Soviet Navy had launched its first nuclear-powered attack submarines, giving the USSR below-surface capabilities greater than perhaps any country except the US. Soon after, the Soviets also developed nuclear SSGN-class subs, running on nuclear power but designed to launch limited ballistic missile strikes against American aircraft carriers and other naval deployments. Over the next three decades, the Soviet Navy continued to build and maintain a large fleet of submarines, relying on them heavily to challenge America's greater military strength during the Cold War. Because the true names of Soviet subs were rarely known abroad, most are still referred to by NATO codenames, such as the Alpha-class nuclear subs. These use liquid metal-cooled reactor propulsion systems and titanium hulls, enabling them to move extremely fast, over 43 knots, or 80 kilometers an hour, at an operational depth of 2,000 feet, or 600 meters. Also important to Soviet deterrence and power projection were the Typhoon-class subs. The largest submarines ever built, Typhoons are over 563 feet, or 172 meters long, have a beam of 81 feet, or 25 meters, and can carry up to 20 sturgeon nuclear-capable ballistic missiles. These were just a few of the many varieties of subs developed by the Soviet Navy, and the Soviets also continued heavily building diesel-electric models as well, such as the Kilo-class attack subs and others. The fleet was never able to make the switch to fully nuclear-powered, largely due to budgetary and technological constraints. However, by its peak in 1980, the USSR's submarine force had 480 boats, including 71 fast attack and 94 cruise and ballistic missile submarines. Even following the fall of the Soviet Union in 1991, this submarine fleet remained a major part of Russia's naval power. Dmitry Gorenberg of the Center for Naval Analyses has noted that during the post-Cold War period, Putin has focused on developing new submarine capabilities, while Russia has essentially lost the ability to construct new, advanced surface vessels. The most advanced of these submarine developments are the Yasin and updated Yasin M-class SSGNs. Developed in the 1990s and early 2000s, Rand Corporation researcher Edward Geist has described these as the crown jewel of the contemporary Russian Navy and perhaps the pinnacle of present-day Russian military technology. And according to Admiral Fogo, one major advantage of the Yasin-class vessels is that they are very quiet, which is the most important thing in submarine warfare. They can also carry both Sircon hypersonic and long-range caliber cruise missiles. Yet these deadly subs also come with a hefty price tag. The Severa Davinsk, the first Yasin-class model, reportedly cost over $1.6 billion. While this is still much cheaper than the US's most advanced subs, it is a very high price tag considering Russia's far smaller economy. In the past few years, Putin's government has also claimed that even more nuclear subs are in the works, including what Russian state media claim to be a new division of submarines carrying nuclear-capable super torpedoes in the coming years. Nick Childs, senior fellow for naval forces and maritime security at the International Institute for Strategic Studies, has argued that investments in submarines up to this point are one of the only things which has allowed Russia to maintain its status among the leading powers. While its fleet is still far smaller than during the Soviet era, Childs points out that it remains very capable and along with some of the older submarines would still pose a threat to NATO, both at sea and against land-based targets. But even before the war in Ukraine, there were some doubts about the true effectiveness of Russia's impressive-seeming subs. While they are doubtless in better shape than its surface fleet, they have never been truly tested in combat. So how are Putin's submarine fleets faring in the Russo-Ukraine conflict? On land, the reckless nature of Russian military doctrine has been on full display in the invasion of Ukraine. But despite the enormous losses by Russia's ground forces, its navy has so far played a very limited role in the conflict. This includes its submarines, which have remained mostly as a nuclear deterrent and threat. 
The exception to this is Russia's Black Sea Fleet, where submarines off the coast of Sevastopol and Novorossiysk have been used to fire caliber missiles into Ukraine. None of these subs have so far been damaged or destroyed, and there are still concerns that they could be used to counter NATO activity and control trade routes in the Black Sea. But the consequences of Putin's invasion have created a different kind of problem for the Russian Navy and its submarines. The crushing regime of Western sanctions imposed on Russia has begun to erode the country's ability to resupply and maintain its military industry. And in December of 2022, the US State Department added even more sanctions directly targeting Russia's naval power. These have already begun to work, cutting Russia off from the technology required in modern subs. As Admiral Foggo told Newsweek in an interview, I think they have been severely crippled by these economic sanctions and by their own foolishness in the war in Ukraine. In particular, the maintenance of existing subs and development of new ones will become increasingly difficult since, when they don't have the raw materials, they can't sustain the industrial base. They don't have the manpower because that manpower is going into fighting the war in Ukraine. Military losses and brain drain make it likely that Russia will lose its ability to compete with Western countries in submarine development, especially when it comes to their ability to project power. Graham P. Hurd of the George C. Marshall European Center for Security Studies argues that the protracted nature of the conflict and the coming Ukrainian counteroffensive undercuts Russian military credibility. The repeated military failures in Ukraine have created growing pressure in Russia to project an image of strength through its submarines. In turn, this has incentivized the Russian Navy to take greater risks by using submarines which are not seaworthy and fast-tracking new weapon systems without proper testing. Heard added that submarines are the most expensive ticket item in Russia's military budget and have no obvious utility in this war so Russia compensates and projects power through acceptance of greater risk. As a consequence, Russia's submarines will suffer indirect and long-term damage the longer the war lasts. Similarly, Heard and other experts have pointed out that the sanctions illustrate just how much of Russia's military-industrial complex was, and remains, reliant on critical Western technology. Without the advanced components for submarines manufactured in the US, UK, France, Germany and elsewhere, Russian development will be seriously stunted in the years to come. And there are almost no alternatives to the technology which sanctions have cut Russia off from. Parts from China and Iran, for example, are not advanced enough to meet Moscow's requirements. While experts remain divided on just how dependent Russia's nuclear submarines are on Western tech, it's pretty clear that at least some of the imported components are necessary to build new vessels. These are mostly thought to be technologically advanced electronic components for guidance, communication and missile deployment. Russian defense journalist Alexander Timokhin wrote in January that the sanctions imposed on Russia after the special military operation left a sharp imprint on the country's technological capabilities. The production of radar complexes, communication systems, guided missiles, sonar equipment and other similar systems has proved to be difficult. As a consequence, these restrictions could make it nearly impossible to build Yasin and Yasin M-class subs and other highly capable boats. Childs from the International Institute for Strategic Studies points out that this trajectory is already visible, as while the newest Russian submarines are very capable, Russia's inefficient shipbuilding industry has struggled to deliver them on time and in significant numbers. Like other experts, he agrees that Russia's construction shortfalls will accelerate in the coming months and years, since this could well be exacerbated by the increased demands on other sectors of the defense industry as a result of the war, as well as from the impact of sanctions on certain key components. So what do these deficiencies mean for Putin's ambitions and the future of the Russian military? Well, experts have outlined two main possible scenarios for the future of Russia's submarine fleet. One possibility is that as military resource constraints continue to grow, it will lead to prioritization of the elements which have been most impacted, especially ground forces. As of May 2023, Russia has lost nearly 200,000 soldiers, a truly staggering figure for a modern military. In turn, as one analyst put it, that will inevitably lead to cuts, or limits at least, in shipbuilding in the future. The other possibility is that Russia will be forced to funnel more investment into submarines due to their relative importance and strategic value. 
This will mean less and less resources for replenishing ground troops and equipment, which are both cheaper and more expendable. But even if Putin opts for the second scenario, any money spent now is likely to have a delayed impact. Past investments in submarine development and maintenance will carry the Russian fleet for at least a few more years to come, but within five to ten years, it could be a very different picture. Just based on the size and current capabilities of Russian submarines, it will likely remain one of the world's most powerful fleets for the next decade. But after that, things are far more uncertain. Any modern submarine which breaks down in the years could become essentially useless, reduced to just so much expensive scrap metal. However Putin attempts to manage his growing economic constraints, the main role of Russian submarines will probably remain as a nuclear deterrent. And there are also some indications that Putin has already realized just how spread thin his resources really are. In March, Russia's Pacific Fleet underwent a series of military drills which were described as a surprise inspection of more than a dozen submarines, potentially signaling a lack of faith by the Kremlin in the readiness or maintenance of the fleet. Readouts from the Kremlin show that Putin recently told Defense Minister Sergei Shoigu that while Russia's priorities remain the war in Ukraine, still, the objective to develop the Navy, including in the Pacific Theater of Operations, remains relevant. Adding that, it is clear that some of the fleet's assets can be used in conflicts elsewhere. This indicates both that Putin does not believe submarines can make much of a difference in Ukraine, and that they remain most useful as a nuclear deterrent. As Russia's submarines begin to break down in the coming years, with no easy way to maintain them or build new state-of-the-art models, the country will also become less able to project power in this way. This will almost certainly happen, regardless of where the Kremlin prioritizes resources, especially since casualties in Ukraine show no sign of slowing down. As losses climb higher and higher, and as sanctions continue their squeeze, it may also provoke Putin into even more aggressive and reckless strategies. In fact, there is evidence that this is already taking place. In the past few months, Russia has deployed submarines in increasingly threatening positions. As Michael Peterson, the director of the Russia Maritime Studies Institute, told Newsweek, we have indications that nuclear-powered submarines have been deploying off the coast of the United States and into the Mediterranean and elsewhere along Europe periphery, in ways that mirror Soviet-style submarine deployments in the Cold War. Such aggressive posturing is likely tied to Putin's growing issues in an attempt to project a facade of Russia as a true global power, despite an economy less than half the size of California. This weakness is also reflected in overly optimistic predictions for its military-industrial complex. A recent analysis by the Institute for the Study of War ISW, concluded, similarly to other experts, that Russian officials continue to claim that Russian defense manufacturers are increasing production amidst ongoing indications that the Russian Defense Industrial Base DIB, is unable to meet Russia's long-term economic and military goals. There have been rosy claims by officials like Alexei Rachmanov, head of the Russian United Shipbuilding Company, that submarine production time will soon be cut by 8 to 13 months. But there is little evidence to support this. And in another sign of growing weakness, Putin signed a decree on February the 27th, reducing previous plans to construct at least three nuclear reactor-equipped LIDAR-class icebreakers by 2035 down to just a single vessel. Again, this likely reflects the fact that the need to replenish the stocks of conventional ground weaponry lost in Ukraine will likely consume the majority of Russia's DIB and limit Russia's ability to produce systems aimed at longer-term strategic goals. This includes both nuclear icebreakers and submarines, indicating that Russia's resources are spread much thinner than Putin would like the world to believe. So, to sum up, despite the claims by the Kremlin, there are strong signs that Russia's disastrous strategy in Ukraine has backfired even more than we know. The squeeze of Western sanctions now threatens to render even the deadly Russian submarine fleet obsolete. The longer the war goes on and the more isolated Russia becomes, the harder it will be to obtain the advanced components needed for these vessels. This will continue to erode the country's industrial base, possibly crippling all long-term defense production. And because Russian losses in Ukraine are so heavy, Putin also faces a crisis of credibility and growing pressure to project a facade of power. This has already led to reckless, aggressive posturing by Russian subs and a willingness to use vessels which are not even seaworthy, a problem which seems likely to increase. Because the Russian Navy has historically been so reliant on them to project power, 
there is little question that the stagnation of its submarine fleet will be a serious blow in the coming years. But what do you think? Will sanctions and battlefield losses eventually doom Russia's submarine fleet? Or can Putin find a way around these issues and keep Russia as a great power? Let us know what you think in the comments section below. And don't forget to subscribe for more military content and analysis. Before February 24, 2022, the Russian Federation looked like it would deploy or soon be able to field some pretty formidable new weapons. In everything from fifth-generation fighter jets to modern tanks to new body armor and even tsunami-causing nuclear torpedoes, there was enough hype to make even informed Western national security experts worry about what they were seeing. Little wonder that they believed Ukraine would fall in days in the months prior to the invasion. Those predictions did not turn out to be the case. And now two years later, Russia still finds itself fighting a war of attrition with no end in sight. In this video, we'll take a brief look at how Russia's military arsenal has failed to live up to the hype, and why it has failed, and even why some of the weapons Russia claims it's developing will likely not perform as advertised. If they can build them at all, that is. Russia has one aircraft carrier, the Admiral Kuznetsov. The Admiral Kuznetsov began its life in the 1980s and was commissioned in 1991, just before the Soviet Union's collapse. However, this carrier is not of the same quality as the US Navy's aircraft carriers, which use a catapult system to rapidly launch their planes. Instead, it uses the STOBAR, Short Takeoff Barrier Arrested Recovery System, which makes its planes far slower to launch than the American Nimitz and Ford-class carriers, or China's Fujian. The Admiral Kuznetsov has also been plagued with problems with frequent deadly accidents. The ship has been under repairs since 2018, with one delay piled onto another. It was originally supposed to return to service in 2021, but obviously that did not work out as planned. The ship is finally supposed to return to service in 2024, but that date is still questionable. Corruption has also plagued Admiral Kuznetsov's repairs. Three years ago, the director of the Murmansk shipyard was arrested on suspicion of embezzling rubles, the equivalent of $600,000. Such corruption is rampant in the Russian military and has long proven a problem with weapons development, logistics, and maintenance. The Admiral Kuznetsov saga is a good way to start the video because it reveals deeper problems in the Russian Navy, which include outdated equipment, incompetence, and corruption which have all played out in the war as seen in Ukraine's success against the Black Sea Fleet, despite having no navy of its own. Russia's surface navy is in poor shape in other ways. It is steadily retiring its Soviet-era ships and replacing them with lighter, less combat-worthy vessels. This process is slowly but surely causing the Russian navy to lose its blue water capabilities and confining it closer to the coasts. One of the ways that Russia has attempted to mitigate this trend is through a new class of destroyer, the Lyder class. If completed, the Leider-class destroyer could prove a formidable new addition to the Russian Navy. It would weigh 19,000 tons and be powered by nuclear propulsion, making it twice as large as the Soviet-era destroyers it would be replacing. It would even be larger than the three Slava-class cruisers in service with the Russian Navy. The ship's size would make it capable of supporting new weapons, such as the 3M22 Sirkon winged anti-ship hypersonic cruise missile, which is a naval version of Russia's S-500 air defense system. The Leider class would also be able to field the Packet NK torpedo and Packet MTT anti-torpedo. The offensive version can hit targets up to 10 kilometers away, improving the range on Russia's previous torpedoes with a much more accurate targeting system. If the Leider and its classmates were to come online, it would be a big improvement over the Russian Navy's current ships. Unfortunately for Moscow, this new destroyer has suffered from numerous delays. The Leider-class destroyer was first revealed in 2015, with Western experts seeing it as an attempted answer to the United States Zumwalt-class destroyers, then under construction. Unfortunately for Russia, these new destroyers have not taken to the sea, in fact, they have not even begun construction nearly 10 years later. Construction on the new class of destroyer was finally supposed to begin in 2023, but that year has now come and gone. The LIDAR project was even dropped from the Kremlin's 2025 state armament program, which made foreign defense experts question its future. Russian sources claim that its being dropped from the state armament program did not mean that the LIDAR had been cancelled, but rather that funding for it had been reduced. As of 2024, we cannot know when, if ever, construction will begin, and therefore that the Russian Navy will continue to get smaller and lighter as its older and heavier ships get retired. The problems for the Russian Navy go deeper than the surface vessels. 
Its underwater fleet is also aging, and its supposed newest and greatest submarine is also probably an item that owes its reputation more to advertising than performance. The Belgorod submarine, and particularly its Poseidon torpedo, are two other items of hype in the Russian Navy that don't seem to stand up to scrutiny. The Belgorod and Poseidon have often been items of fear in Western media and national security circles, which have nicknamed the former Russia's Doomsday Submarine. According to the Kremlin's hype, the submarine and its arsenal of smart drone Poseidon torpedoes can unleash a 100 megaton yield capable of creating radioactive tsunamis that would inundate coastal communities and make them unlivable. However, tests of the Poseidon have seemingly proven less than satisfactory. That shouldn't be too surprising, because for the Poseidon torpedo to work as the Russians claim, it would need to be able to house all of the equipment needed for a nuclear reactor to convert atomic fission into electricity and propulsive force while ensuring negligible waste heat to avoid detection. It would also need the hardware to shield its sensitive electronics from the nuclear fission process. Unfortunately for Moscow, the torpedo is too small to do this, meaning that it's either an object of hype or Russian engineers have come upon a technological leap enabling exotic engineering methods. We'll let you decide which of the two scenarios is likelier. Meanwhile, even if the Poseidon's yield was 100 megatons, which it almost certainly is not, it would still not be large enough to generate the type of tsunamis the Russians claim it can. Instead, the likeliest scenario is a yield of about 1 to 2 megatons per torpedo, which would be enough to inundate a coastal area with dangerous radioactive waters but not create a tsunami. The Poseidon torpedo also faces engineering problems with its supposed speed. With a purported speed of 100 knots or 185 miles per hour, the Poseidon would be faster than all of the torpedoes in the arsenals of NATO member countries. However, if it were to go that fast, the torpedo would be easily detectable to sonar equipment, emitting noises far beyond the level of civilian ships that it would ordinarily try to hide behind. The torpedo would also have difficulty fulfilling its mission at the shallow depths which it would need to navigate in order to target coastal cities which is its purported function, according to James Mack, a former nuclear and electronics technician with the United States Navy. If the Poseidon were to be traveling at its advertised speed of 100 knots or more in depths that shallow, it would not only be detectable because of the high heat it would generate, but also suffer from cavitation, the formation of vapor cavities in a liquid when it has been accelerated to high velocities. Cavitation can create shockwaves that damage machinery, meaning that the Russians have either compensated for this with unknown new engineering techniques and technology, or the claims of the Poseidon again do not stand up to scrutiny. This will be far from the only time in the video where this dilemma presents itself in relation to a Russian weapon system. There is also only one Belgorod submarine, meaning that it can easily be tracked by satellite surveillance when it needs to dock for upkeep. From this surveillance, intelligence analysts have a good chance of guessing its mission, International defense experts guessed just that when Belgorod conducted its exercises in the autumn of 2022, for example. We now journey from the sea to the skies and look at the Russian answer to the American fifth-generation F-22 and F-35 fighter jets, the Su-57 Felon. To be fair, the Su-57 does have some impressive features, like its 3D thrust vectoring engines, climb rate of 64,000 feet per minute, 66,000-foot service ceiling, Mach 2 speed, and a range of 2,186 miles without refueling. In a plane versus plane battle, the Su-57 should be a capable opponent against any fighter plane on the planet. However, the Su-57 has a big drawback, its comparative lack of stealth. Aviation experts regard the Su-57 as being by far the least stealthy of the fifth-generation fighters currently in service. For example, the F-22 Raptor is detectable at a range only under 10 miles, while the Su-57 would be detectable at a range of 35 miles. Its stealth features are also concentrated in the front of the plane, meaning that if it turns or maneuvers, it's far more detectable. Some aviation experts are even less kind and believe the Su-57's radar cross-section is similar to that of the F-A-18 Super Hornet, which is 1,000 times less stealthy than the F-35 Lightning II. Therefore, they say the Su-57 is not a true fifth-generation fighter jet, but rather an advanced fourth-generation one. The lack of stealth means that advanced radars from other fighter jets or air defense systems are capable of detecting the Su-57 and destroying it from long range. These weaknesses seem to be confirmed by the way Moscow has used the new felons it has in service. The Su-57 has played little part in the war in Ukraine, as the Russian aerospace forces have refused to field it in Ukrainian airspace. 
Instead, it has only attacked targets at long range from within Russian airspace. The limited use of the Felon speaks volumes about the Russian brass's confidence in its stealth attributes, or lack thereof. It's also unlikely that the Russian military will be able to manufacture the Felon in the numbers needed to make it truly formidable. The Kremlin ordered 76 Su-57s in 2019, 22 are in service as of December 2023, after several years of delays. It's difficult to see how Russia will field the Su-57 in adequate numbers anytime soon, giving it limited effectiveness as a means of making war. Russia is more well known for its tanks than its planes. However, the newest Russian tank has even more problems than the Su-57. To be fair, the T-14 Armata does have significant improvements over the tanks Russia has usually fielded in Ukraine, the T-72, T-80 and T-90. These tanks have been lost in their thousands during the fighting in Ukraine, thanks to bad doctrine and their own design flaws. Because they do not segregate their ammunition magazines in a sealed compartment, they have often suffered from complete destruction with jack-in-the-box explosions. The T-14 Armata mitigates this flaw with a protective capsule, isolating the crew from their vehicle's ammunition magazine. The vehicle's profile adds further protection, as its low silhouette avoids exposure of its parts to enemy fire. The Armata's main weapon is a 125mm 2A82-1M smoothbore gun, which can fire related rounds and laser-guided missiles. This weapon would be a significant threat to the Western main battle tanks that Ukraine began fielding in large numbers last year. Unfortunately for Russia, this gun is not backward compatible with its older tanks, which means that only the Armata can field it, and that's a problem because there has never been a confirmed sighting of the T-14 in Ukraine. Russia has even fewer T-14 Armata tanks than it does Su-57 fighter jets. From its inception, the tank has been mired in production delays. When it publicly revealed the tank in June 2015, Moscow claimed it would field 2,300 of them by 2020. That obviously never happened. In 2021, Russia promised serial production, but that didn't happen either. To date, only about 20 prototypes have been built. The T-14's engine in particular has proven to be an item of difficulty to manufacture. Unlike most of Russia's tanks, the Armata uses a derivative of the German X-shaped Simmering SLA-16 engine, which was designated as the A853. However, this engine was not designed for a tank, but as a unit for compressor oil and gas pumping stations. Nevertheless, it was chosen as the basis for the Armata, and the tank was designed around this engine, rather than the other way around. While it had attractive features, being smaller and more powerful, though heavier than the standard Russian tank engine, it never truly proved adequate, and the Armata cannot be resized to fit Russia's proven and reliable tank engine, the V92S2F. The problem has presented a sunk cost fallacy to the Russian brass, as it has been reluctant to start on a new tank, instead struggling to find a way to make the engine problems work for the Armata. Meanwhile, the electronics for the Armata's sensory and fire control systems are no longer as widely available due to the sanctions put in place as a result of its invasion of Ukraine. Indeed, there has not even been an assembly line built for the Armata, and all of the prototypes have been made by hand. Given all of these problems, don't expect to see the Armata fielded in large numbers, if at all, anytime soon. The lack of a modern tank is a big problem for Russia because its current tanks have often found themselves outgunned on the battlefields of Ukraine as well as lacking adequate protection. Russia's tanks lack the range of their Western rivals because they cannot raise their guns as high. For example, the T-90, Russia's latest tank before the Armata, can only raise its gun by 14 degrees or lower it by 6 degrees. The Abrams, on the other hand, can raise its gun by 20 degrees and lower it by 9. The additional flexibility means that the Abrams can hit targets at longer ranges than the T-90 or the other tanks Russia can field in Ukraine in large numbers. The lack of gun mobility also makes the Russian tanks more vulnerable in urban combat than their American counterparts, as fighters can shoot down on them with anti-tank weapons from rooftops or high windows and leave the armor unable to retaliate. Russia learned this lesson the hard way in its wars in Chechnya around the turn of the millennium. Russia has been unable to modify its tanks since then, however, and has suffered from ambushes in the same way during the war in Ukraine. The combination of flaws in the ammunition storage and the lack of firepower and flexibility has left thousands of tanks destroyed in the war, and Russia cannot seem to mitigate this problem because it cannot manufacture the T-14 Armata in large enough numbers to change the situation. 
Russia could try to overcome these disadvantages with changes in doctrine, including deploying infantry and other units to better support its tanks in combined arms operations, but there is no indication that Russia has built a capacity to do so. Decades of Soviet deep battle doctrine and centuries of Russian reliance on mass to overwhelm an opponent, no matter the casualties, have proven too difficult for the Kremlin's military commanders to shake. Meanwhile, engineering problems apply not only to Russia's current military gear, but the ones it claims it has coming. For example, Russia's body armor has also been a subject of embarrassment. Many of Russia's soldiers, especially the conscripts Putin mobilized in the autumn of 2022, have lacked proper protection. Infamously, some Russian troops were issued airsoft versions of the Ratnik body armor. Despite its problems in this area, Russia has made some bold claims about what it has coming down the pike. Its next-generation Sotnik body armor, which it says will be able to stop a 50 caliber Browning machine gun round. The Sotnik armor is supposedly going to be made of polythylene plastic fibers to keep its weight down. Polythylene is effective against incoming rounds because as the material heats up from the energy transfer, the plastic melts, adhering to the bullet and slowing it down. The principle has proven effective in other body armor systems around the world, and indeed if there is enough polythylene, it could work in the same way against a 50 BMG round. However, a .50 BMG round transfers over 11,000 pounds of force onto its target, enough to punch holes through a cinder block wall. To say the least, it would require a lot of polythylene to put a stop to a round this powerful. Even accounting for improved efficiency, it's hard to believe that a soldier wearing this sort of armor would be mobile on the battlefield. Russian engineers would have a very tough hill to climb if they wanted to design a polythylene armor that would afford such protection against an incoming 50 caliber machine gun bullet and keep the wearer mobile. We should treat the Sotnik body armor with skepticism, to say the least. Another big example of engineering challenges built into Russia's future weapon systems comes with the sixth-generation fighter jet it supposedly has in the works, the MiG-41. According to the Kremlin, this jet will be the fastest aircraft in the world, with a cruising speed of Mach 4. If it works as Russia says, the fighter would also have a ceiling superior to any other aircraft at 85,000 feet. Unfortunately for Russia, the MiG-41 is almost certainly an example of a weapon that would never be able to work as it claims. If the MiG-41 were to fly at its cruising speed, let alone what it would reach with its afterburners, it would lose its stealth attributes. Supersonic flight creates high heat and friction. Such friction erodes the stealth materials that help to reduce the radar cross-sections of planes like the F-22 and F-35. Additionally, the heat signatures involved in such high-speed flight would make the MiG-41 easily visible to radar. Russian engineers would need to have exotic technology on their hands to mitigate such a weakness. Don't count on that. The MiG-41 is supposed to be an evolution of the MiG-31 interceptor, which was designed to counter the American SR-71 Blackbird spy plane. It was built to reach speeds of Mach 2 for that purpose. The problem for Moscow is that an interceptor is a far different order of business than a fifth-generation fighter, let alone a sixth, and the SR-71 has been retired from the American air fleet since the 1990s. Why the Russians would choose to develop their sixth-generation fighter from an outdated concept is puzzling and suggests that even without the engineering challenges to get it to work as advertised, the MiG-41 could suffer from the same problems as the T-14 Armata, a frame built around a questionable concept. According to the Kremlin, the MiG-41 will have its maiden flight in 2025 and begin delivery in 2028. But given Russia's long delays in introducing new weapon systems or even repairing existing ones, we should take those claims with a heavy grain of salt, to say the least, even if everything else supposedly works. What do you think about these failures of Russian military engineering? What other weapon systems from Russia have proven not to live up to the hype? Don't forget to let us know in the comments. Also, don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe to the channel for more military analysis from military experts. Russia has had many failures in Ukraine, but its naval shortcomings are likely the most humiliating. Can Putin find a way out of this constant humiliation? Here's the scoop. Before the war, experts were worried that Russia's Black Sea Fleet would help it to overwhelm Ukrainian resistance. For example, they feared that Russian ships stationed in Crimea would launch missiles into Ukraine free of retaliation. They also dreaded the possibility that the Black Sea Fleet would assist in Russian amphibious operations, especially in an attack on Odessa, the third largest city in Ukraine. The success of such an operation would completely cut Ukraine off from the Black Sea, 
and leave it as a landlocked rump state. In the earliest days of the war, these experts watched Odessa and the Black Sea Fleet closely. Their attention was probably better focused elsewhere, because Russia's navy was, much like everything else in its military before the war, all talk and no show. Far from achieving naval supremacy in the war, Russia's navy has instead been effectively contained by Ukraine. What does this turn of events say about the Russian navy? In fact, the disaster did not come as a surprise to some experts, who had noted the decline in Russian naval capability ever since the fall of the Soviet Union. In this video, we'll take a look at the rather dilapidated state of Russian naval power. Ever since the days of Peter the Great in the early 18th century, Russia has aspired to become a sea power, often going to war to secure favorable coastline and ports. Unfortunately for Moscow, Geography is its greatest enemy in its quest for naval parity with other great powers. Most of Russia's ports freeze over in the winter. Others, such as those in the Baltic and Black Seas, are contained within choke points. This geostrategic weakness has proven to be a big challenge for Russia historically, and the same is true for its war in Ukraine. The 1936 Montreux Convention regarding the regime of the Straits permits Turkey to bar warships from passing through the Dardanelles and Bosporus during wartime cutting off transit between the Black and Mediterranean seas. Turkey invoked the convention's wartime provisions for the first time a few days after Russia initiated its so-called special military operation. The invocation meant that Russia could not reinforce its Black Sea fleet, and as a result, Russia's naval brass became much more careful about deploying its existing ships. Such caution helped to ensure that the Russian army and navy would prove incapable of properly supporting each other throughout the war. The situation in Ukraine is only the latest example of geography getting in the way of Russia's quest for naval power. However, the Russian navy has far deeper problems. Command structure is one such problem. The Russian navy has no single command, making it difficult for Moscow to design and implement a comprehensive naval strategy and plan for new programs or updates to existing ones. Russia's navy has also suffered from a shortage of money, and much of the money that's been devoted to it has become misallocated due to corruption. Before the invasion of Ukraine, Russia's naval problems were getting more obvious. The fleet size has continually shrunk. Older ships are often taken to the scrapyard before newer ones can replace them. Because of this, Russia is slowly but steadily losing its naval presence in the Arctic, a region that China, with its expanding navy, is increasingly interested in. And even the Caspian Sea, where other post-Soviet countries are building their fleets. Russia's navy is aging too. The fall of the Soviet Union also caused the fall of much of the Russian shipbuilding industry. The end of the Cold War led to an end in the demand for many of the naval projects the Soviet Union had once required, atrophying the shipbuilding industry further. Skilled workers retired or had to find other jobs. Institutional experience began to evaporate. Important manufacturing equipment decayed. The shipbuilding industry was also partitioned as a result of the collapse. For example, much of the infrastructure that created the engines for Russia's warships wound up in Ukraine, since that is where much of them were built in Soviet times. As of November 10, 2023, the Russian Navy has a total of 265 fleet units, and the World Directory of Modern Military Warships ranks it third in capability behind the United States and Chinese navies. Russia has 185 fleet core units, such as destroyers, frigates, and corvettes, 58 submarines, 21 amphibious assault units, and one aircraft carrier, the Admiral Kuznetsov. However, the Admiral Kuznetsov is indicative of Russia's deeper naval problems, so it's a case worth exploring. The aircraft carrier has been in dry dock for repairs since 2018, with the ship supposedly set to return to action in 2024. The repairs have been plagued by accidents and corruption. In 2019, a serious fire broke out. Two years later, the director general of the Murmansk shipyard, where the repairs were taking place, was arrested on suspicion of embezzling rubles equivalent to about $600,000. Only one example of the widespread corruption in the Russian Navy we've mentioned before. Even if it were repaired and returned to action in 2024, the Admiral Kuznetsov would not help to change the situation in Ukraine for Russia's forces because it cannot be moved to the Black Sea. The Admiral Kuznetsov is also not a state-of-the-art aircraft carrier. Although it was built in the 1980s, which was around the same time as many of the Nimitz-class carriers in the US Navy's fleet, it does not operate with a modern catapult system like they do. Instead, it uses the Stobar, 
short takeoff but arrested recovery method. This means that it cannot launch its planes as rapidly as America's aircraft carriers, making it a less capable asset in power projection for Russia. The Admiral Kuznetsov is not the only less-than-modern ship in the Russian fleet. The Russian Navy's combined median hull age is 30 years. In comparison, the median hull age in the United States Navy is 23.3 years. At first glance, this would not seem too far behind, and it's true that the United States Navy has been collecting aging vessels, but as we will see shortly, America can fully replenish its fleets over a reasonable time. Russia has much deeper difficulties on its hands. When they have seen action, Russia's antiquated naval vessels have experienced problems in Ukraine. The most famous example came in the sinking of the flagship of the Black Sea Fleet, the Moskva, in April 2022. Despite the Moskva's being an air defense cruiser, it sank when it got hit by a pair of Ukrainian Neptune anti-ship cruise missiles. Since the attack, observers have wondered how the Moskva's S-300F and 9K-33 OSA air defense missiles, its close-in 30mm cannons, chaff, decoys, and electronic warfare systems could have all failed to prevent the attack. Meanwhile, after getting hit, the Moskva did not prove survivable. It was a 40-year-old ship whose fire-extinguishing systems were outdated. Ukraine has also frequently used drone boats to damage or destroy Russian ships. On November 10th, Ukraine released footage of the drones at it again, attacking Russian landing ships. Footage showed at least one of them on fire in the water after an impact. Russia's navy has proven incapable of adapting to the demands of the war in Ukraine, and it appears that it will not be able to do so anytime soon. The sinking of the Moskva and other naval difficulties was a predictable result for some Russian military watchers who had been complaining that their country's fleet was aging poorly. Prior to the war, Putin had claimed that improving the Russian Navy's combat abilities was a priority of his. However, economic and logistical difficulties got in his way. Although Russia's defense spending increased under Putin, Russia has often lacked the manufacturing ability to modernize its armed forces. This lack of capacity would not be new or only confined to the Navy. Russia proved unable to manufacture the T-14 Armata tank or Su-57 Felon fighter jet in large numbers prior to the war. In many respects, the naval problems are worse because the Soviet Union's industrial institutions were never adequately replaced after they shrunk or vanished. Prior to the invasion, Russia had attempted to build new guided missile frigates of the Admiral Grigorovich class for its Black Sea fleet, but sanctions following Russia's unilateral annexation of Crimea prevented this from happening. In an irony, Russia needed engines made in Ukraine to propel these ships. In 2019, Russia had hoped to add 14 more of the supposedly stealth Admiral Grigorovich-class ships to its fleet, but only had the engines required for two of them. Russia tried to develop domestic gas turbine engines as a replacement for the engines Ukraine denied it, but has not yet begun production. In 2019, NPO Saturn, the Russian company tasked with manufacturing the engine for the new frigate, claimed that it had got its initial orders from the Ministry of Defense. However, sources quoted by Reuters at the time said that there was no guarantee about how many engines the MOD would actually buy. Ukrainian observers said that it would be at least five years before production of these engines began. Much more severe sanctions imposed since then will make the problem of building new ships for Russia's surface fleet that much steeper. Russia has also had a problem maintaining its existing surface fleet. The fire on the Admiral Kuznetsov during repairs in 2019 was only one of the many accidents and episodes of mismanagement that the Russian Navy is prone to. For example, the Kara-class cruiser Kerch caught fire in 2014 under mysterious circumstances. A shipyard fire in 2016 damaged a new minesweeper that was under construction too. And if you thought the repairs to the Admiral Kuznetsov were slow, consider that the Soviet-era nuclear-powered cruiser Admiral Ushakov had been idle for nearly two decades before 2019 when the Russian naval brass finally decided to scrap it. Russia originally had plans to modernize all of its Kirov-class nuclear-powered cruisers, but in 2012 announced that it would do so on only one of them, the Admiral Nikimov, scrapping the others. This is all part of a trend. The 265 fleet units in the Russian Navy as of 2023 is a sharp decline from the 360 ships that American observers believed it had on hand in 2019. That year, Russia saw the delivery of 23 new surface ships, a fact which brought a lot of fanfare in its homeland. However, just seven of these were armed combatants. 
The others were small missile corvettes that displaced no more than 2,000 tons of water. Displacement matters. One of the more accurate ways to measure the true power of a country's navy is through its combined tonnage. Heavier ships can not only carry more weapons and absorb more damage, but they can also stay at sea for longer. For example, the United States builds large warships because they often need to travel thousands of miles from ports in the homeland to reach their destinations and perform their worldwide missions. Heavier ships can carry more fuel and other supplies. Lighter ships are more vulnerable, less powerful, and can stay at sea for a limited amount of time. This is one of the reasons why American experts are not overawed by China having the world's largest navy by total vessels. Most of the Chinese ships are light and would fare poorly in a direct confrontation with the United States Navy. Now, as Russia steadily retires its Cold War era fleet, it is increasingly facing the same problem that China has a fleet of small vessels with limited displacement. For example, Russia has built new Bayan and Bayan M corvettes. However, these supposedly new ships lack anti air and anti submarine capabilities. They are also small and incapable of operating far from the coast. The new Kyrakurt class ships are better able to operate in deeper waters, but they also lack anti air and submarine capabilities. In 2019, the Russian Navy displaced a total of only 1.2 million tons. The United States Navy displaced 4.6 million. The gap has grown further since then as a result of Russia continuing to retire older, heavier ships and replacing them with lighter ones. The result is that Russia has an aging surface fleet, increasingly in need of repairs and unable to modernize despite the increase in defense spending. Meanwhile, the newer ships being delivered to the Russian Navy are not adequately replacing the ones being scrapped. Russia's surface fleet is getting smaller, less capable in battle, and less able to project power over long distances. We've seen that firsthand in Ukraine, where Russia has been unable to establish naval superiority in the Black Sea west of Crimea, despite its opponent having no navy. Russia's ships are too old, vulnerable, and incapable of supporting amphibious operations. To make matters worse, the new ships seem to have little strategic purpose, which expects any confrontation between it and the United States to take place in the waters of the first island chain close to its territory. There is rationale behind building smaller vessels that can operate close to bases on the Chinese mainland. For Russia, however, this rationale does not exist. Because of its geographical isolation from the world's waterways, it needs larger ships if it is to project naval power abroad. However, Russia is steadily losing its Blue Water Navy and is increasingly contained to the less than ideal waters near its coastline. Russia's submarine fleet appears to be better off than its surface vessels. For example, it's in a much better place than China, which still lags far behind in underwater warfare. Of Russia's 58 submarines, 37 of them are nuclear-powered. 11 of these are ballistic missile submarines. 17 of them are conventional attack submarines, and 9 are cruise missile submarines. The other 21 submarines are less modern diesel-electric attack submarines. However, just like the surface fleet, Russia's submarine fleet continues to shrink in size. The current force of 58 submarines is a downward trajectory from the 61 that Russia had in 2015, and its precipitous decline from the 366 submarines the Soviet Navy had in 1985. Although much of the reduction in fleet size had to do with the end of the Cold War, Russia has lacked the money needed to build new submarines to replace the older ones reaching the end of their service life. For example, it needed to scale back the production of its Oscar II-class nuclear-guided missile submarines and Akula-class attack submarines. The lack of funds delayed the more modern Yasin-class attack submarines too, with the first one taking 20 years to build. Only two of them exist. Russia's diesel-electric submarines, the Kilo-class, have proven easier to build, thanks in part to international exports to countries like India. India has 12 Kilo-class submarines in its fleet, domestically called the Shishuma class. However, in 2013, one of these caught fire and exploded, raising questions about the viability of its design. Just as Russian tanks are becoming a less popular item for international buyers, Russia's naval designs are facing the same problem, further depriving the Kremlin of the money it needs to modernize its military. Russia's submarine fleet has played almost no role in the war in Ukraine. Instead of missiles from Russian submarines hitting Ukrainian targets, the opposite has proven the case. In September 23, Ukraine launched Storm Shadow cruise missile attacks on the Russian Black Sea Fleet in Crimea. A Russian submarine was one of the targets hit in this attack. Are there ways for Russia to make up for its growing naval disadvantages? To cover the shortfall in domestic industrial capacity, 
Russia has considered importing naval engines from China, but that's a prospect which comes with its own shortfalls. China's military technology is questionable at best, and in the face of international sanctions following the invasion of Ukraine, such orders will make Moscow even more dependent on Beijing. China could drive a hard bargain in Russia's pursuit of a modern navy. Russia is also trying to create new domestic ship designs that will help to mitigate its shortcomings. However, these seem to lack proper coordination. The Russian Navy has been designing three different frigate and five different Corvette-class ships at the same time with little coordination. The lack of a unified naval command is playing a part here, and the competing projects are draining money from the Navy's coffers instead of allowing it to concentrate on the best design. One might consider it a worse version of the United States Navy's literal combat ship program, which saw two different designs drain money from other, more promising ways it could have been used. Russia has had hopes for Project 23560 LIDAR, a large destroyer which supposedly could, if built, adequately replace the Udaloi or Sovremeni destroyers, which are typically over 30 years old. Project 23560 LIDAR is also supposedly capable of replacing the Russian Navy's four Slava-class cruisers, the youngest of which is the 25-year-old Pyotr Veliki. The Russian Navy designed the LIDAR to be a competitor for the United States Navy's stealth Zumwalt-class destroyers, which began commissioning in 2016. The LIDAR was first unveiled in March 2015, as the Zumwalt program was ramping up in America. However, the LIDAR-class destroyer remains theoretical. In 2021, sources claimed that construction would begin in 2023, but this has not happened. There were rumors that the program had been scrapped, with it being dropped from the Kremlin's 2025 state armament program. Sources in Russia's shipbuilding industry then noted that the program had not been scrapped, but funding for it had been reduced. And as we've seen, because Russia lacks shipbuilding infrastructure, it could take decades for the first LIDAR-class destroyer to be completed, even if construction starts. As a result of these problems, Russia is stuck with trying to modernize its existing destroyers, which, as we've seen, is a daunting prospect on its own. If Russia could update the ships adequately, such as outfitting them with modern sensors, they could theoretically stay relevant. However, given the Russian Navy's history of corruption, shortage of money, and demonstrated poor planning, that's not a prospect one should be excited to bet on. The inability of the Russian Navy to bring the LIDAR-class destroyer to reality for institutional problems and lack of funding is an embarrassment for the Kremlin, but it's part of a common historical thread that spans beyond Russia. Maintaining and modernizing military forces is and always has been an expensive business in money and institutional energy. Historically, this reality has meant that most nations have needed to concentrate on either land or sea power. For example, the United Kingdom spent heavily on the Royal Navy during its imperial century, but only kept a small, although very capable and professional, land army. Russia may have long sought to be a sea power, but its geography has dictated that priority must be put into its land forces. It may have pretensions to the contrary, but post-Soviet Russia does not have the resources to build up a top-quality navy. As we've seen in Ukraine, it will need to concentrate on its army even more as it will emerge from the war depleted of men and material. Increasingly, a navy is a luxury that Russia cannot afford. But what do you think about the state of the Russian navy? Is there anything the Kremlin can do to turn the situation around? Don't forget to let us know in the comments. Also, don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe for more military analysis from military experts. Putin's invasion of Ukraine is a disaster, and it's no wonder. The man is a paranoid megalomaniac who goes around poisoning his opposition's underpants, uses outdated Soviet-era weapons and tactics on the battlefield, and isolates himself from the world to a degree that is clearly eating away at his sanity. And that's not all. If you haven't heard this before, we're here to talk about it today. Putin is a thief. While there are numerous military mistakes that Russian generals and armies have made, the mistakes begin at the top with Putin himself. No surprise there, right? But you may be surprised at just how fast and crazy this sea of mistakes, dirty little secrets, and even just basic stupidity really is. Here's the scoop. You can tell how big a thief Vladimir Putin is by how many articles and documentaries have been made about how he's stolen Russia blind. One pertinent article is literally titled just that, Stealing Russia Blind. Written by Harley Balzer and published in the Journal of Democracy, in the article, Balzer points out that Putin has established a sistema, the Russian word for an established and accepted system, based on massive predation that has produced the most unequal wealth distribution in any developed economy. 
Estimates have suggested that Putin and his oligarch cronies have stolen more than a trillion dollars worth from the Russian economy since the fall of the Soviet Union in 1991. But that is just the beginning of Putin's kleptocracy story. Putin's experience with government-level theft started early, long before he reached Russia's throne, when he managed to steal $124 million worth of funding that was designed to feed the starving population of St. Petersburg in the wake of the collapse of the Soviet Union. In 1996, he was able to protect his boss, St. Petersburg Mayor Anatoly Sobchak, when Sobchak lost an election over a corruption scandal and fled the country, an escape arranged by Putin himself. That ability to protect his corrupt friends is what garnered attention by the equally corrupt Russian President Boris Yeltsin in 1999, who was leaving office during an investigation into his own massive corruption. Estimates by four different worldwide organizations of the level of endemic corruption in Russia suggested that at a minimum, $30 billion a year was being stolen from the Russian economy. That amounts to 10 to 12 percent of the national GDP, and that was just what the investigators could prove. Eventually, those losses cost his country dearly. Money that should have gone to train soldiers, to modernize equipment, to keep planes flying and tanks in working order, to simply fill up their gas tanks, all this had been stolen from Russia's military. That higher figure of $1 trillion worth of theft was mentioned again by investigator Bill Browder, who also suggested that Putin's net worth alone is in excess of $200 billion. These funds could have also gone to better roads, better healthcare, and better everything in Russia, not just a better military. But it's the kleptocracy rampant in Russia's military that the invasion of Ukraine has brought front and center. Russia has been undergoing a much vaunted modernization effort that's been ongoing since 2008. But these efforts have failed to root out Putin's personally embedded Sistema, which is present in all levels of Russia's military. The army's infantry commanders frequently inflate the number of active personnel in their units, and from the excess, those commanders steal the surplus funds for themselves. The accounting is continually plagued by falsified numbers of both men and material, which leads to false appraisal of the unit's true combat capability. But the units are not only plagued by missing soldiers and supplies, their lower-level commanders and sometimes the soldiers themselves have sold available gear and even their own vehicles gasoline for money or traded them for alcohol. All branches of the armed forces generally have unreliable and opaque reporting up and down the command chain, which has led Russia's leadership to believe its forces were better, quantitatively and qualitatively, than they really were at the start of the invasion. And with the lack of available gear for their newly mobilized troops, some soldiers or their families have had to resort to buying their own weapons, their own bulletproof gear, and sometimes even their uniforms. That's just… sad. And weird. And it's about to get weirder. Putin is personally responsible for the three segments that underpin his rule as an autocrat. He perpetuates his rule by maintaining absolute secrecy. He isolates himself from reality by listening to only a very select few advisors. And he surrounded himself with yes-men whose only redeeming quality is their unwavering loyalty. Since the beginning of the invasion in February of 2022, Moscow has, if anything, doubled down on silencing frank discussion of the conflict even going so far as to criminalize assessments of combat deaths and forecasts about how the war might unfold. Criticism of the war – it's still technically a crime to call Putin's special operation a war, though some media darlings have finally used that term – remains completely off-limits, including discussion of military incompetence and the absence of accountability that has led to the military's serious problems inside of Ukraine. This censorship makes it hard for the military elite to get accurate information on what's going wrong in the war, which in turn hampers their efforts to correct their mistakes. Meanwhile, the level of secrecy that Putin has made an intractable part of the Russian Sistema was one of the biggest reasons for the early failure of the invasion. The self-defeating deception caused by Putin's decision to prioritize operational secrecy and domestic blindness to the impending war led to a notable lack of adequate planning. Pre-invasion secrecy led to avoidable problems that specifically affected the initial application of Russian air power. Russian pilots had gained some experience fighting air battles in Syria, but operations there had taken place over mostly uncontested desert terrain, where enemy opposition could be spotted and dealt with long before it became an actual threat. Russian pilots had almost no experience fighting over a forested country like Ukraine, a much more defensible and far larger area than the rebel-held enclaves in Syria. These pilots also hadn't trained against an opponent with any kind of layered air defenses and numerous manned portable air defense systems or man pads that Ukraine possessed. 
Russian pilots were given little to no training in such tactics before the invasion. That unpreparedness is partly why Russia has been unable to establish air superiority over the Ukrainian battlefield, and why they've met with such heavy losses in the air. Another factor in the failure of the air assets was how Russia decided to employ their forces. Because their ground troops were in grave danger within days of the invasion, the Russian Air Force had its primary objective switched from suppressing air defenses to providing close air support, which in turn brought them into greater danger from the numerous Western-supplied manpad systems. These missions forced Russian pilots to engage targets at low altitudes, which placed them well within the range of cheap and numerous anti-air missiles, like the US-made Stinger. After the first few months of this, Russia found itself not just suffering unacceptable losses of expensive aircraft and helicopters, but also significant drain of their trained pilots and aircrew, which take months or years worth of training to replace. And while all this is going on, Putin remains in his creepy little cave of isolation and delusions of grandeur. Not only is Putin's insistence on secrecy a major problem, but he has insulated himself from the reality of the world by relying on just a handful of advisors. By orchestrating the invasion with just a handful of military advisors, many of whom earned their positions not by being good strategists, but by being loyal to a fault, Putin created a plan that had no basis in reality. For example, the primary invasion thrust south from Belarus toward Kyiv brought only enough rations for the troops and fuel for their vehicles to last two to three days. The level to which Putin and his advisors were out of touch with reality was displayed by the troops who carried with them dress uniforms for their expected victory parade in the middle of the capital. Putin's invasion plan was filled with faulty assumptions, arbitrary political goals, and planning mistakes that ignored key Russian military principles. The initial invasion called for multiple unsupported lines of attack, with no reserve forces, tying the military to far-flung objectives that were unattainable for the modest size of its ground forces. Due to such isolation, Putin erroneously believed that his war plans were sound, that Ukraine would not put up much resistance, and that US and NATO support would not be strong enough or arrive fast enough to make a difference. The invasion plan reinforced in Putin's mind by his sycophantic comrades painted a picture of the valiant Russian army riding unchallenged into the territory of Ukraine. The brotherly Ukrainians would welcome them with open arms and would thank them for rescuing all of Ukraine from their neo-Nazi and corrupt drug-addicted leadership. The overmatched Ukrainian forces would run at the first sight of overwhelming Russian forces. After Kyiv fell within three days, the liberators would then receive a warm greeting in the southern and eastern regions of the country. The Russian elder brothers would then install a properly subservient government in Kyiv that would gratefully accommodate any demands Putin placed upon them. It came as quite a shock then, when Russia's troops, which along with its direct leadership had no inkling that they were going to be an invading army, and ran headlong into a fierce and unified Ukrainian resistance, supported by unexpected amounts of advanced Western weaponry and accurate satellite-supported intelligence. The three-pronged invasion suffered far more casualties than they either expected or could cope with. According to Russian doctrine, any major-level war, such as the Ukraine invasion, should have begun with weeks of air and missile attacks targeting an enemy's military installations and critical infrastructure. Russia's planners consider this the decisive period of warfare, with air force operations and missile strikes lasting between four and six weeks, designed to erode the opposing country's military capabilities and capacity to resist. According to Russia's military doctrine, ground forces are typically deployed to secure objectives only after massive artillery bombardments combined with air force and missile assaults have weakened or destroyed most of the opposition. But Putin's delusions aren't the only issue in the Ukraine war. When you have a leader who's lost touch with reality, and a whole crowd of people cheering all hail the emperor's new clothes, your kingdom is pretty much doomed. General George S. Patton used to say, if everybody is thinking alike then somebody isn't thinking. Patton was always keenly aware that yes men, those who only tell their bosses what the boss wants to hear, aren't helpful at all, but only reinforce what the boss is already thinking. In 2022, one of Putin's most significant intelligence figures defected to the West, carrying with him a trove of important information about Putin the man, detailing his habits, his fears, and his reluctance to use any cell phones. Gleb Karakulov, who served in the Federal Protection Service FSO, a quasi-military force tasked with protecting those officials closest to Putin, described Putin as a president who has lost touch with the world. Putin has been living in an information cocoon for the past couple of years, spending most of his time in his residences, 
which the media very fittingly calls bunkers. He is pathologically afraid for his life, he surrounds himself with an impenetrable barrier of quarantines and an information vacuum, he only values his own life and the lives of his family and friends. Karakulov also shed light on Putin's inner circle. Putin requires all staff working in the same room as him and anyone who will appear close to him in photo ops to undergo a two-week quarantine, which severely limits the number of people who have personal access to him. Karakulov confirmed that Putin relies heavily for information on reports provided by the chiefs of his security services. Putin does not use a cell phone or the internet and does not even bring an internet specialist with him when he travels abroad. He only receives information from his closest circle, which means that he lives in an information vacuum, Karakulov said. Ok, so we've established Putin is pretty much running his own operation into the ground. But this isn't the only reason Russia is failing in the Russo-Ukraine war. Let's talk about Russia's abysmal logistics for a second. The famous quote, amateurs talk strategy, professionals talk logistics, has been credited to everyone from Napoleon to US General Omar Bradley. But the first recorded use of that phrase in that form was by a retired four-star marine general named Robert Hilliard Barrow. He was speaking about the difference between localized maneuvers that could win a battle and overall army supply coordination that could win or lose a war. Russia's invasion of Ukraine was plagued by logistical nightmares from the very beginning. Ukraine knew they could depend on their home-designed Skiff or Stuna P anti-tank guided missile ATGM systems, but they also knew they'd be facing 2,000 or more Russian main battle tanks, plus more than twice that number of armored infantry fighting vehicles IFVs. Knowing that Ukraine needed help against these armored forces, the US and its allies managed to deliver more than 17,000 anti-tank missile systems to Ukraine within the first month of the war, including the Anglo-Swedish short-range in-law rocket and the even more powerful US-made Javelin ATGM. Ukraine was also supplied with Bayraktar TB2 drones from Turkey. Ukraine used these weapon systems not just against Russia's armored forces, but also against even more valuable targets, their fuel and ammunition vehicles. Without resupplies of ammunition, their tanks and even their infantry had to resort to more limited attacks and without fuel, some of their armored columns ground to a halt completely. Most famous, the 40-mile-long armored column that struck south from Belarus toward Kyiv in the opening days of the war was stalled due to a combination of stiff Ukrainian resistance, primarily ambushes from either side of the narrow penetration, combined with successful targeting of Russia's ammo and fuel trucks by both anti-tank missiles and targeted drone attacks. Military analysts who have analyzed the early months of the war have come to the conclusion that Russia completely botched its initial invasion for a variety of reasons and that its campaign has been riddled with miscalculations, poor communication, and widespread confusion. Former CIA military analyst Jeffrey Edmonds, who is also a Russia expert at the Center for Naval Analyses, says in a recent interview, We would have thought that they would have done a much more deliberate, well thought through operation. That is not what they did. Russian warfare usually involved masses of artillery pounding enemy locations, followed by massed armor and mechanized infantry assaults, combined with air support and helicopter attacks. Instead of leading with a substantial air and artillery campaign and gaining strategic superiority over Ukraine, Russian commanders apparently instructed their troops to just drive to Kyiv. The units quickly faced unexpected ambushes, repeated tactical surprise, and a logistic supply train that had not anticipated anything beyond a half-week offensive. The 40-mile traffic jam north of Kyiv underscored another recurring problem with Russian logistics. They are dependent on rail lines to move troops and support gear around their own country, but cannot link those rail lines up with their offensive advances into Ukraine. That leaves a gap between Russia's end-of-the-line ammo and fuel dumps and the Ukrainian front lines. One solution Russian commanders used to reduce that gap, and the length of time it would take to resupply forward units, was placing their supply dumps closer to the front lines. That decision turned disastrous when the US began providing Ukraine with better artillery systems, including the M142 High Mobility Artillery Rocket System, or HIMARS, with its pinpoint accuracy out to 50 miles, twice the range of the M777 howitzer Ukraine had previously been using with its 25-mile range. But Russian commanders failed to respect the accuracy and range of HIMARS systems and continually lost weapon storage depots over and over again. Too often, Russia placed their ammunition in the same building as their troops or close by to such a location. That proved disastrous on at least one occasion, 
when Ukraine struck an occupied school building in Makiivka in the Donetsk region on New Year's Eve, killing as many as 400 Russian soldiers and wounding another 300, according to Ukraine claims. Another persistent problem in Russia's logistics fiasco has been the reliance on unsecured phone lines. This has allowed Ukrainian intelligence to triangulate their position and strike them with highly accurate artillery and missile strikes. One such attack reportedly left hundreds of Russian soldiers dead and prompted the Russian Ministry of Defense to announce it is already clear that the main reason of what took place included the massive use, contrary to the ban, of personal mobile phones in the range of enemy weapons. Yet such use persists, both from the average trooper to the high command. The Russian news agency TASS suggested that the New Year's Eve attack was also due to soldiers' misuse of civilian cell phones. Preliminarily, the reason for the strike was the active use of mobile phones by the newly arrived military personnel. The enemy revealed the activity of cellular communications and the location of the subscribers, which allowed them to target the temporary barracks. And then there's Russia's mass misjudgment of NATO's united front. Putin and his tiny handful of advisors also miscalculated the stiffness of NATO's resolve to defend Ukraine, as well as their willingness to arm them with every weapon system they could. Putin believed the individual countries of NATO, led by the US, Germany, France, Great Britain, and Poland, would each go their separate ways and would fail to provide a united front against what Putin expected would be a short blitzkrieg-type war. Instead, his brutal invasion solidified NATO's unity and even helped convince new countries like Finland and Sweden to ask for membership. Finland's admission, making NATO's 31st member, was an especially bitter pill to swallow as it increased NATO's border presence with Russia by an extra 830 miles. This was clearly one of Putin's most significant blunders. The US, NATO, and the European Union have remained relatively united in providing billions of military aid to Ukraine as well as considerable humanitarian assistance, while simultaneously applying sweeping sanctions against Russia. The sanctions have crippled the Russian economy, which took an extra hit from the loss of between 700,000 and 1 million young Russians who fled the country ahead of Putin's draft in the fall of 2022. The Russian population pyramid, already in an upside-down position with a declining birth rate and far more older citizens than young ones to replace them, is now teetering like a half-chopped-down tree, ready to collapse at any moment. Now let's get into the truly ridiculous part of our analysis of Putin's failures as a war commander, fighting a modern war using World War I tactics. By the end of the first year of the war, it became clear that in addition to all the strategic and leadership mistakes Putin and Russia have committed, there's a vast difference in how the two armies are fighting it out on the ground. While Ukraine has relied heavily on smart weapons, surveillance and attack drones, ATGMs, man pads, precision guided munitions, even drone attack boats in the Black Sea, Russia has settled on the World War I tactic of massed artillery, followed by human waves of soldiers often without even the benefit of a few tanks sprinkled in here and there for support. Such tactics may have worked in World War I or even the latter stages of World War II, when the former Soviet Union had more than a million men under arms and was facing a severely weakened German army that had bled white from four years of continuous warfare. But Ukraine has learned to adapt and overcome and has used its precision artillery systems, especially the HIMARS artillery, to telling effect. Meanwhile, Russia has used their huge surplus of artillery to flatten cities like Bakhmut, Mariinka, and Mariupol. But the massed infantry assaults that followed leveled a horrific toll on the attackers. Estimates are that in addition to losing more than half of their pre-war stockpile of main battle tanks, Russia has lost more than 200,000 soldiers killed, wounded, or captured. Their losses in the 10-month effort to take Bakhmut have been so enormous that the Wagner private mercenary group that spearheaded the 10-month battle had to pull out of the line of combat to refit, retrain, and regroup. Some estimates say that Wagner may have lost 90% of their 80,000-man full strength. Wagner's leader, Yevgeny Prigozhin, will only admit to having lost 20,000 men, which is still a staggeringly high number of casualties for a city that has no inherent strategic value. While we're on the subject of losses, let's talk about the real crime and tragedy of this war. Because of the sanctions limiting Russia's access to computer chips and other resources for their high-tech industries, Russia has been unable to replace many of their advanced weapons, such as their precision munitions and state-of-the-art missiles. That's why analysts are stunned to see Putin wasting so much of its stockpiles of precision munitions on striking civilian targets. Military experts and government officials have said 
that Putin's terror campaign against the Ukrainian population was not a sustainable use of Russia's limited stockpiles and was unlikely to negatively affect Ukraine's will to fight. In fact, just the opposite has happened. Continued explosions in civilian areas across Ukraine, not just the capital of Kyiv, have hardened the average Ukrainian's resolve to see this fight through until every Russian soldier has been pushed out of their country. More recently, senior U.S. intelligence officials have said Russia is burning through its munitions faster than it can replace them. Officials also say the use of massive amounts of artillery and precision-guided munitions has forced Moscow to turn to Iran and North Korea for supplies. Retired U.S. Army General David Petraeus summed up just a few of the mistakes Putin has made during his invasion of Ukraine when he said, They completely underestimated the Ukrainian forces and completely overestimated the Russian forces, and they could not impose their line of conducting a military campaign and prepare forces for conducting this campaign. In addition, they did not have modern telecommunication systems, he said, referring to their use of civilian cell phones. Therefore, the generals continued to die, commanding an army from within an intelligence vacuum, relying on sycophants and toadies rather than experts and veterans. An army sent to war without proper planning, hamstrung by poor logistics, and saddled with rampant thievery, underestimating your opponent's will to fight, misjudging NATO's united front, squandering sophisticated precision weapons on a campaign to try to break the will of a large civilian population, youth movement to leave the country possibly for good, an economy that has been wrecked by sanctions that continue to penalize the ones who are still left day after day. It seems like Putin not only did not follow Sun Tzu's dictum to win your battles by making no mistakes, it seems like he's made practically every mistake in the book. But what do you think? What is Putin's greatest mistake in the war in Ukraine? Let us know in the comments, and don't forget to subscribe for more military analysis from military experts. Looting is a common occurrence in war, happening in virtually every conflict. But what is its impact on war itself? Is it technically allowed? If not, what are the consequences of going ahead with it anyway? And here's an interesting question to ponder. Could the soldier's desire for plunder become a weapon of revenge wielded by those who endure the act? Let's find out. Looting has always been a part of warfare. In ancient times, military leaders often rewarded their men with booty for their services in the fighting. The plot of Homer's Iliad, the world's most famous war story, centers on a quarrel over the proper distribution of the spoils of war, in this case, a captive woman. As militaries evolved, some armed forces came to see looting as more of a problem than a solution, as it eroded discipline and created problems with the local population. In the current United States Armed Forces, Looting is strictly governed by Article 108A. According to this article, looting by American military personnel is punishable by a bad conduct discharge, forfeiture of all pay and allowances, and confinement for six months. If the items looted exceed $1,000 in value or involve firearms or explosives, the punishment increases to a dishonorable discharge, forfeiture of all pay and allowances, and confinement for five years. These strict laws have not stopped looting entirely, but are a sign of the Pentagon's commitment to prevent the type of looting seen by American soldiers in World War II, where the practice was technically illegal, but nevertheless widespread, with many officers turning a blind eye to the realities of what went on. The strict governance of looting is far from true of the Russian military in Ukraine today, where looting is a policy of war and statecraft for the Kremlin. Unfortunately for Russia, the results of looting haven't always been to the invaders' liking. In this video, we'll look at the reports about looting in Ukraine and how the victims of this practice have found creative ways to use the age-old desire for booty as a weapon to get back at their tormentors. The Russian military in particular has a long history of looting which informs its conduct in Ukraine today. Mass thievery was widespread in the Soviet era. In a preview of things to come a century later, the Bolshevik invasion of the Ukrainian People's Republic in 1918 saw looting as a deliberate tactic of war implemented by the operation's commander, Mikhail Muravyov. Widespread looting and destruction in the capital Kyiv resulted. Muravyov was eventually punished for this policy, but the practice persisted in the Russian ranks and became institutionalized. Looting was a fact of life in the Red Army in World War II, with everyone from common soldiers to the Russian commander Georgi Zhukov profiting from the practice. The most famous collection of valuables the Soviets looted during the war was the hoard that came to be called Priam's Treasure. 
which was discovered by the archaeologist Henrik Schliemann in 1873, while digging in the modern city scholars believe was the site of Homer's Troy. Ironically, Schliemann himself looted this treasure out of Turkey. The Red Army took these artifacts from Berlin back to Moscow. This act retroactively was legalized by the Russian Federation. The treasure remains the subject of dispute between Russia, Germany, and Turkey to this day. Although the Soviet Union dissolved in 1991, the spirit of looting remained in the military institutions of its successor state. Looting was part of the brutal experience of the Chechen Wars in the 1990s and early 2000s, and was also on display during Russia's Georgian campaign in 2008. One of Georgia's legislators at the time, Givi Tagomadze, said of the Russians, they behave like medieval hordes. They take away computer equipment, but that's okay. But household items? Stools? I do not know where they live. Probably, Russians have neither military bases nor normal houses. It looks like they are not paid money, but are offered to live off the loot during such raids. When the modern invasion of Ukraine began, it did not take long for reports of looting to circulate. Security camera footage in the stores of Belarusian delivery services showed many Russians returning from the Kyiv front, waiting in line to send looted property back home. On March 12, 2022, when the war was only about two weeks old, the Ukrainian intelligence services reported that looting was already epidemic among the Russian ranks. This mass thievery was partially a matter of necessity because of Russian logistical difficulties. Being deprived of supplies, Russian soldiers had been instructed to go into self-sufficiency mode. Their officers permitted them to take everything they needed from local homes and businesses. The looting may have been a matter of basic survival for some of the Russian troops. One Russian paratrooper who took part in the initial operations that captured Kherson, but who subsequently fled to France and applied for asylum, Pavel Filatiev, mentioned in his reports that many of the troops were so deprived of food that they raided supermarkets or household kitchens in desperation. Like savages, we ate everything there. Oats, porridge, jam, honey, coffee. We didn't give a damn about anything. We'd already been pushed to the limit. Most had spent a month in the fields with no hint of comfort a shower, or normal food. Indeed, the food supply in Ukraine was so bad at the beginning of the war that Russian soldiers who had been posted in the Chernobyl exclusion zone took to hunting and fishing radioactive wildlife to satisfy their hunger. We'll have more stories from Chernobyl later in the video. Although some of it may have been necessary to secure vital supplies, much of the looting in Ukraine came from far more self-interested motives. Filatiev also reported widespread looting of more valuable objects like laptop computers, which are worth more than the annual salary of a Russian soldier. With such low pay, the incentive to loot is obviously magnified. Cars have also been a popular object of thievery among Russian military personnel in Ukraine. Stolen cars from early in the war were also routed back to Russia through Belarus. Ukrainian media sources claimed that Russian troops had stolen hundreds of kilograms of property per person by September 2023. Some of the stolen objects were indeed necessary to sustain a soldier's presence on the battlefield thanks to the Russian military's logistical incompetence, but many were not. Some of these war trophies were sometimes downright unusual. In an act that might have served to further corroborate some of Filatiev's claims about the Russian military lacking food, soldiers were caught stealing animals from a zoo in November 2022 as they were being forced to withdraw from the city during Ukraine's advance on it that month. The soldiers were seen on camera loading a raccoon, a llama, a bear, a kangaroo, and two wolves into trucks to be taken across the river to safer territory. The incident led to perhaps the most bizarre tweet of the war, where Ukraine's Ministry of Defense vowed reprisals for the theft, steal a raccoon and die. Why the Russians would steal zoo animals but leave valuable military equipment behind remains a mystery, unless perhaps the soldiers really were that short of food even so close to Crimea. Another of the more bizarre examples of looting occurred early in the war, when Ukrainian forces found scattered lingerie in the streets of one of the villages near Kyiv. The Russian soldiers apparently wanted to ship these stolen pieces of underwear to their wives and girlfriends back home, but did not have time because Moscow ordered its forces to retreat from the region. The result was that Ukrainian soldiers came across the stolen property and circulated the video around social media. The stolen lingerie might be strange, but it shouldn't be surprising. Intercepted phone calls have often revealed the Russian soldiers' intentions. In one of them from late March 2022, a soldier brags about having stolen cosmetics and trainers for his wife back home. Maybe even more tellingly, the wife says, that will do, it will be a souvenir from Ukraine. Why, it's fine. 
what kind of Russian person would steal nothing. She later tells him to take everything, take whatever you can. The wife particularly desired a laptop for the couple's daughter, who was going to school, and some nice-looking tracksuits. This phone call was far from the only example. Many more phone calls intercepted by Ukrainian security services show wives encouraging their husbands to steal everything they can get their hands on. In another strange example of looting spread on Ukrainian social media, Russian soldiers were caught on aerial footage looting a washing machine from a home. The soldiers carried the stolen washing machine back to a military vehicle painted with the infamous Russian Z symbol. Other household appliances, like air conditioners, have also been popular booty items for Russian soldiers. Russian troops have also been known to steal solar panels. Russian soldiers have taken to stealing farming equipment too. In early May 2022, CNN reported that Russian soldiers had stolen $5 million worth of equipment from a farm dealership in Melitopol. 27 pieces of equipment were looted in total, including tractors, harvesters, and cedars. This equipment was then hauled back to Chechnya. Unfortunately for the thieves, the equipment's owners had remotely locked the mechanical equipment, rendering it unusable. When last seen, the stolen goods were idling in Grozny. Reportedly, the Russians were consulting experts in trying to find ways to unlock the equipment. At worst, reporters noted that the Russians could disassemble the vehicles and sell the spare parts for a profit. Lower tech items were also stolen from the farm dealership. Grain and even building materials were also on the looters' list of targets. Russian soldiers have also taken to looting Ukraine's museums. Russian forces have looted artwork as a matter of course. They've also taken much more specific and ancient treasures. In Russian-occupied Melitopol during the spring of 2022, an official in a lab coat was seen accompanied by a squad of soldiers into the city's museum of local law. There, the Russians carefully took 198 treasures out of the museum. The museum's staff had hidden the artifacts before fleeing in the wake of the invasion, but the objects were eventually discovered by the invaders. Included among them were two 2,300-year-old golden crowns from the Scythians, a nomadic tribe often mentioned by ancient Greek historians who dominated the area at the time. Observers believe that Putin wished these objects to be taken to Crimea as a demonstration of the peninsula's cultural ties to Russia. But perhaps the most bizarre instance of looting during the entire war came in a crypt in St. Catherine's Cathedral in Kherson. In October 2022, with Ukrainian forces closing in on the city, Russian soldiers broke into the House of the Dead and took the bones of Grigory Alexandrovich Potemkin, a lover of the Russian Empress Catherine the Great and a man who played a vital role in Russia's original annexation of Crimea in 1783. Russian soldiers also looted a statue of Potemkin and took it further behind the lines. The theft of Potemkin's bones and the treasures in Melitopol in particular could serve a political purpose, with Putin using them as objects of propaganda to promote his still unrecognized claim to Crimea and his broader vision of Russian nationalism. The deliberate stealing of these cultural treasures shows the semi-official nature of the looting policy in the Russian military. Putin took steps to make this policy official when he declared martial law in the occupied regions of Ukraine in October 2022. As part of the annexation where he declared them legally part of Russia, Putin inserted language that legalized looting under the guise of preservation. Conveniently, special measures were also extended to areas outside the territories he declared were now annexed into the Russian Federation. Looting has been used as an instrument of economic statecraft as well. For example, an investigation by PBS in October 2022 revealed that Russia had sold $530 million of stolen Ukrainian grain by way of a sophisticated smuggling operation in cooperation with the government of Syria. The high demand for grain allowed the Russians to find customers who were less than concerned about doing careful inspections of the merchandise's origin. Known customers by that month included Lebanon, Egypt, Libya, Iraq, and Saudi Arabia. Smuggling operations like these allow Russia to skirt sanctions and acquire currency to fund its war machine. Meanwhile, some grain was simply stolen and sent back to the Russian interior by way of Crimea. The Russian military has also used looting as a policy for the waging of war. During the retreat from Kherson in late 2022, the Russians did more than steal zoo animals or the bones of a famous figure. In a far more serious act, the soldiers took any piece of medical equipment they could get their hands on, including ambulances. They also took a particularly keen interest in forcibly evacuating doctors across the river to Russian-controlled territory. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky said that the move was part of a policy 
to make Kherson the only regional capital Russia had conquered since the start of the invasion uninhabitable. However, the looting hasn't always gone well for the Russian forces in Ukraine. The Ukrainian people understood when they were invaded that the Russian soldiers would try to get booty for themselves and have adapted to this desire, punishing them for it in the process. If looting is an instrument of war for the Russian military, the Ukrainians have sometimes turned the desire for loot and free stuff around against their Russian attackers, exploiting it as a weakness. Vitaly Semenets, a Ukrainian man from Hostomel whose Apple AirPod earbuds were stolen during the Russian attack on that town, used the Find My app to track the location of the devices. The app allowed him to view the Russian military's positions as its forces retreated from Kyiv across the Belarusian border. Eventually, these devices made their way to Belgorod in Russia in preparation for the later offensive in the Donbass region. It's unknown what happened to this particular soldier who carried this particular pair of AirPods, but the incident provided valuable intelligence to Ukrainian forces. Undoubtedly, many other AirPod devices have been looted, tracked, and the targeting coordinates sent to the Ukrainian artillery or drone operators. In these cases at least, crime really doesn't pay. Other incidents of looting have led to equally tragicomedic deaths. In one bizarre instance, a Russian soldier who had stolen an Apple MacBook laptop had apparently replaced his Kevlar body armor with that device. He was subsequently killed. As to how such a thing could have happened, your guess is as good as ours. Forgive us for being a bit stereotypical, but Russian soldiers' love of vodka in the war has also led to problems for its soldiers. On December 4, 2023, Newsweek reported that dozens of Russian soldiers had been killed after ingesting poisoned vodka and other foodstuffs in occupied Crimea. On a post to its Telegram channel, a Ukrainian partisan group called the Crimea Combat Seagulls boasted that it had killed 24 Russian soldiers and 11 officers after its fighters offered them toxic food and drinks in the city of Simferopol, the second biggest in Crimea. According to them, two cute girls came to the checkpoint of the military unit and introduced themselves as local residents. They brought seven bottles of vodka and some snacks, fish, sausage, bread, cheese. They told the guards that they wanted to thank our boys for everything, for protecting them. The guys took vodka and food, drank with colleagues and ate, and many were poisoned. This was not the first time that poisoned food or drinks had inflicted some of the more unusual Russian casualties in the conflict. In April 2022, Ukrainian villagers in the Izium district in Kharkiv Oblast gave Russian soldiers poisoned pies. Two were killed and 28 were rendered seriously ill and taken off the line. In Melitopol in November 2023, Ukrainian partisans fed Russian members of the Federal Security Service food laced with rat poison. Three were killed and an officer was seriously ill and was taken to the nearest hospital in critical condition. Undoubtedly, Ukrainian soldiers and partisans have used Russia's supply vulnerability and propensity for looting foodstuffs to their advantage. Vodka and liquor are popular items for theft in the Russian ranks, and while not all of these drinks are poisoned, they add to the problem of elevated alcoholism in Moscow's military. In November 2022, as the Ukrainian counteroffensive was near its height of success, the Institute for the Study of War reported that Russian soldiers who were desperate to leave the front lines had taken to alcohol abuse and even self-mutilation. Ukrainian forces also claimed that abuse of alcoholic beverages was widespread in the Russian ranks. Earlier reports suggested that alcohol abuse was so common among Russian soldiers that the Kremlin itself could no longer tolerate it and had to prohibit their purchase in several regions of Ukraine, including southeastern Zaporizhia. As early as 2000, the Russian military was reported as suffering from rampant alcoholism. While the country was still in a state of post-Soviet transition then, Putin's rule and military reforms seem to have done nothing to halt this practice. The looting of alcoholic beverages has contributed to Russia's combat ineffectiveness in Ukraine. Abusing alcohol is one thing, and sadly all too common. Abusing radioactive material? That just might be unique. In possibly the dumbest example of looting in Ukraine, Russian soldiers have stolen radioactive material from the Chernobyl exclusion zone, the 30-kilometer radius around the former nuclear power plant that melted down catastrophically in 1986. The Russians occupied this area on the first day of the invasion and held it until the retreat from Kyiv. Photos provided to American media in April 2023 revealed that during this retreat, Russian soldiers had taken most of the radioactive containers that Ukrainian scientists had used to collaborate their dosimeters, devices which measure exposure to ionizing radiation. 
These small containers look like coins. In an interview with VOA News, Siahe Besareb, a Belarus-based science journalist, warned that if these devices are directly touched, they can burn the skin in as little as two minutes. Yet there was photographic evidence from Belarus that the Russian soldiers who had taken these radioactive calibration instruments were sending their dangerous loot back home. When wives hungry for stolen property implored their husbands to take everything, maybe they should have been more careful, because everything can apparently mean dangerous radioactive containers. It is easy to poke fun at Russian soldiers for looting seemingly useless and even dangerous items in Ukraine, but there is a tragic element in this for the invaders as much as for the invaded. As we've noted on this channel before, the soldiers in Russia's military come disproportionately from the country's poor and ethnic minority groups in remote regions like Siberia. This has especially proven the case with the soldiers that Putin mobilized beginning in the autumn of 2022. The people from these regions often live so remotely, so isolated from the rest of the world, that they do not understand exactly what they're taking. One soldier in the Russian army stole a security camera during his time in the town of Lyman in Ukraine, which Russia subsequently lost during the 2022 counteroffensive. This particular soldier was lucky enough to make it out of that disaster intact and brought the camera back home as booty. Unfortunately for him, his misunderstanding of this object and how it transmits its data by connecting to any open Wi-Fi network led to a reality show of his inadvertent creation. The camera was soon broadcasting his home life for public consumption. Intimate and embarrassing moments, such as underwear shots, were put on display. Ukrainian viewers came to see the live stream from the looted camera as an entertaining diversion, a first-hand look into a completely different sort of life in Siberia. The soldier and his wife were completely unaware of this. Although the inadvertent and embarrassing reality show he made of himself is in some ways just desserts for the thief, the incident also revealed, in very human terms, that it's the poorly educated and poorly connected soldiers like these who have borne the brunt of Russia's suffering in Ukraine. However, the footage of the Siberian soldier also reveals the disregard that the Kremlin has for poor and vulnerable people like this. They are often considered expendable, a fact borne out on the battlefield, where mobilized soldiers from Russia's poorer minority regions have been the first into the meat grinder, getting wounded and killed so that people from the European Russian heartland need not. Looting in some sense, then, shows us the tragedy of war for both the victim and often the perpetrator. What do you think about the widespread Russian looting in Ukraine? What other unusual objects were stolen that we might not have mentioned? What other inadvertent problems has looting wound up creating for Russia's forces? What does the looting say about the nature of this conflict for the people on both sides of it? Don't forget to let us know in the comments. Also, make sure to hit the like button and subscribe for more military analysis from military experts. When you're trying to conquer one of the largest areas in Eastern Europe, a little over 233,000 square miles to be exact, which is roughly the size of Texas, and you're running low on tanks, trucks, artillery pieces, aerial drones, and trained military personnel, you can be pretty sure you're failing miserably. Add an increasingly evaporating number of military aircraft to the equation, and it's time to hit the panic button. Be it land or sky, Putin just can't seem to hold on to his weapons. And it's not just embarrassing, it's downright self-destructive. In the case of aerial warfare, it is disastrous. For Russia, of course. Here's the thing. Air power should have been Putin's biggest advantage in Ukraine. When Putin's invasion began in February of 2022, experts and analysts were seriously gloomy about the smaller country's ability to defend its airspace. Most assumed that Russia's much-vaunted air force, the VKS, would be able to quickly overwhelm Ukrainian air defenses and gain a decisive early advantage in the conflict. Even the most optimistic assessments assumed that Russia's air campaign would destroy Ukrainian jets on their bases, while using large-scale ballistic and cruise missile strikes to blind the country's surface-to-air missile radars. This would have forced Ukraine to move its SAM systems away from the front lines, leaving it at a severe early disadvantage and increasingly vulnerable to Russian sorties. But these predictions, often from top conflict analysts, proved to be completely wrong. In more than a year of war, Russia has utterly failed to establish air superiority, while managing to lose staggering quantities of its jets and other assets. In fact, the situation is so bad that earlier this month, one pro-Russian blogger on Telegram, usually cheerleaders for the invasion, stated that the country's air force has engaged in complete idiocy and is detached from reality. Definitely not a good look for Putin. 
So how has this colossal embarrassment happened? As usual, there's no single answer here. But like other aspects of Russia's failure in Ukraine, it has a lot to do with the long-term issues plaguing the country's military. Corruption, bad strategies, poor training, and more. These certainly aren't new issues, but the war in Ukraine has exposed how much they've come to affect Russian capabilities. To get a better picture of how this has happened, let's start with a super quick look back at both fighter jets and air defense systems from the starting point of the most exciting eras in aircraft development, the jet age. The so-called jet age kicked off in the late 1940s, spurred by profound changes in the field of aeronautics. The jets developed during this period could fly faster, higher, and farther than older piston-powered aircraft. This would soon come to transform the aviation industry in both its commercial and military forms. By using the technology of jet propulsion, many pilots believed they could outrun their enemies in the skies and theoretically create total air superiority. Using jet propulsion, aircraft could vastly increase their speed, a major reason why aircraft-mounted guns were mostly replaced by missiles. By far the most reliable way to shoot a supersonic jet out of the sky. Still the go-to weapon for aerial combat today, aerial missiles also revolutionized the nature of air defenses. Today they rely almost entirely on surface-to-air missiles, or SAMs, to prevent hostile attacks from the sky. And from the 1970s onwards, it also became possible for infantry troops to take down aircraft with their own portable handheld anti-aircraft missiles. These manned portable air defense systems, or man pads, are highly cost-effective shoulder-fired rockets able to lock onto aircraft using infrared homing. They are also easy to use, able to be taught to new recruits in a matter of minutes or hours. And since the start of last year, Ukrainians have shown the world just how valuable man pads can be. As Putin's invasion began, Western nations assumed the Russian Air Force would be among the most significant challenges for Ukrainian defenders. When Ukrainian Defense Minister Alexei Reznikov visited Washington in November 2021 to press for weapons, he reportedly told American officials, we have to prepare now. Point number one is air defense. So NATO members sent thousands of man pads into Ukraine to shore up the country's surface-to-air capabilities. Among others, these weapon transfers have included American-made Stingers, high-velocity British Star Streak missiles, and even surplus Soviet EGLOS systems. And this decision really paid off. These comparatively cheap air defenses managed to stop Russia from obtaining air superiority by imposing asymmetrical costs on any Russian pilot dumb enough to enter Ukrainian airspace. For example, using one 60 to 80,000 IGLA missile, Ukrainian soldiers have been able to down a $36 million Su-34 bomber or an $85 million Sukhoi Su-35S fighter jet. This huge cost differential has had effects across the battle space in Ukraine. Because modern combined arms warfare is highly dependent on air support, Russia's failure to dominate the skies has had serious repercussions. The inability to provide sufficient air cover for its tanks, infantry, artillery, or supply lines is one of the reasons Russian forces have taken such devastating losses. Caught in the open, these troops have been falling prey to a range of Ukrainian ambushes from hidden positions on the ground. But does the failure by Russia to achieve air superiority mean a lack of Russian aircraft? Kind of, but not exactly. Ukrainian troops near the front lines around Bakhmut have told reporters that Russia continues to fly daily sorties in hopes of catching their targets unaware. Most of these flyovers last only moments. Russian fighter jets or bombers, often flying in groups of four, fly at low altitude over a target area before quickly dropping or firing their payloads and hightailing it back to their bases. Less maneuverable attack helicopters will also fly right up to the line of combat before firing their missile salvos and quickly fleeing to safety. Another reason for this is the recent addition of the powerful Slovakian S-300 missile defense system to Ukraine's arsenal. This longer-range surface-to-air missile can target Russian jets at higher altitudes, forcing them to fly lower to screen themselves from attack. And in turn, the lower-altitude flights have made them extremely vulnerable to shoulder-mounted missile systems. Because of the medium-range S-300s and shorter-range threat posed by Ukrainian manpads, no Russian air assets are able to spend extended periods of time near the front. Despite the obvious difficulty of shooting down even a low-flying aircraft, the Ukrainian strategy seems to be working pretty well. One report from mid-May 2023 suggested that Ukraine had downed four aircraft in a single day of fighting. While Ukrainian commanders would not confirm their role in the attack, the country's defense ministry stated that the Russian craft ran into some trouble. Numbers like this highlight the focused and effective use of manpads, with soldiers using constant vigilance around the clock 
to exploit the tiny 3 to 5 second firing window. Ukraine's surprising ability to contest its airspace was also partly what allowed it to go on the offensive late last year. Some of this was done with Turkish-made Bayraktar drones, which were used to destroy high-value targets like Russian surface-to-air missiles. This strategy, one that Russia has failed in executing itself, allowed Ukraine to launch more attacks from the air without fear of being shot down. Ukraine also used what limited air power it had in some very creative ways. During the sinking of the Russian Black Sea flagship, the Moskva, Ukraine used a drone to distract the ship's anti-air capabilities before launching a salvo of Neptune anti-ship missiles before the unlucky crew could react. Other tactics have included dispersing aircraft and air defense units out of major airfields, vacating certain air defense positions before they could take any losses from Russian fire, and operating their air defense SAM batteries as pop-up units, rather than large batteries with support vehicles. This final tactic proved to be extremely valuable, stopping Russian forces from effectively targeting most of Ukraine's air defenses. While we now take for granted that Ukrainian soldiers will find creative and deadly ways to use its lesser capabilities, it is still no small feat. In fact, the creative use of air power highlights that Ukraine may now have a better understanding of air operations than even many NATO countries. David A. Deptula, a retired U.S. Air Force Lieutenant General, has argued that the West can actually learn from Ukraine here. We've become so dominant in the air that we've never had to think through how we would use air power if we were the inferior force, he said. Ukraine is posing us some very interesting questions that we should seriously consider, if only to understand how a clever opponent would take us on. Russia, on the other hand, has continually failed to learn from their abysmal performance in the skies. And as with so much else, Russia's systemic failure to establish air superiority also points to the larger issues within the country's military. This became noticeable early on in Ukraine, when rather than overwhelming force, only one or two aircraft at a time conducted strikes against targets in and around Ukrainian cities close to the borders, including Kyiv, Kharkiv, Sumy, Chernihiv, and Mariupol. And when pilots missed their targets, they very rarely mounted follow-up strikes. At that same time, Russian military planners apparently made no plans for large-scale bombardments of air defenses themselves. In fact, they have seemed entirely unable to coordinate the large, complex formations necessary for fighter jets and helicopters to cover each other from enemy fire. More than almost anything else, this helps explain Russia's baffling inability to establish control over the skies, despite its qualitative and quantitative advantages. Western air forces have long taken for granted the ability to coordinate the timing and positioning of their attacks in campaigns like the Balkans, Iraq, or Libya. However, the level of planning, logistical, and command and control capacity needed for such air campaigns is massive. Every pilot needs to coordinate and understand their role in the broader operation, including the exact timing and route needed to strike multiple targets. Tanker support is also critical to ensure refueling can take place at established rendezvous points. The complexity only increases once actual combat begins, as various fighters tasked with destroying air defenses, those engaging enemy aircraft, bombers, electronic warfare escorts, and search and rescue teams must all work seamlessly together and adapt at a moment's notice. Russia has failed on basically all of these fronts. Many Russian pilots are trained to fly exclusively in pairs or fours, with little exposure to larger maneuvers or formations. They also get far fewer flying hours than NATO crews, do not have tanker support for most operations, and are not trained in large-scale aerial combat doctrine. Lacking all these elements, it's no wonder that Russia could not carry out a Western-style air war against Ukraine. And even in the instances where the Russian Air Force scored victories against Ukrainian positions, they were unable to capitalize on those strikes due to fear of man pads and larger surface-to-air missile systems. When Russia refocused its troops in the Donbass region during April of 2022, they were able to gain some localized air superiority near the new front lines, mainly through the use of artillery strikes against Ukrainian SAMs. But even when they were actually able to gain this limited control of the skies, Russia utterly failed to turn it into any type of concrete battlefield advantage. As one analyst from the London-based Royal United Services Institute, or RUSI, put it, the primary reason for this is that despite having more than 300 modern fast jets with theoretically flexible capabilities to carry a range of air-to-air -air and air-to-ground munitions, most Russian aircrew have very limited opportunities to drop precision-guided munitions in realistic training scenarios. Another major factor is actually hitting their targets, as many of Russia's jets do not have targeting pods, a standard feature on most Western military aircraft. 
In fact, while Russia's Su-34 fleet of jets have forward targeting systems and can use precision-guided munitions, they're just about the only ones. The rest of Russia's fighter jets have very limited capability to identify and destroy any battlefield targets which do not show up on radar. This means they've pretty much been limited to attacking fixed targets with satellite or TV-guided weapons or dropping unguided bombs and rockets at predetermined coordinates. One observer noted they are literally cratering empty fields, while an anonymous official from the U.S. Defense Intelligence Agency told reporters early this year that under half of all Russian missiles are hitting their aim point. We're holding Russian missile success at just below 40 percent. In Donbass, this incredibly poor performance has meant Russian jets cannot effectively support ground operations, leaving troops open to a range of ambushes and other tactics. But how did the Russian Air Force end up in such a sad state, especially when Putin ordered a modernization of the fleet just a decade ago? The answer, as with so many things in Russia, seems to be a product of the country's structural issues. While the modernization was supposedly intended to make modern combined force operations easier, it appears to have been mostly for show. One part of this has been inefficiency and widespread corruption. For example, in 2012, one Russian arms company received nearly $26 million to develop an aircraft system for intercepting non-strategic missiles. But the research never actually happened. The company signed the fraudulent contracts with shell companies, the addresses of which were registered to the addresses of public toilets in the Russian city of Samara. In another case from 2016, one company responsible for supplying radio navigation equipment and control systems for guided munitions had a similar scandal. Its top leadership were caught in an embezzlement scheme where they faked research and development techniques in order to steal millions through fraudulent contracts. This type of corruption is common and widespread, also reaching beyond Russia's military-industrial complex and into the top levels of its political elite. So much personal wealth is on the line that some experts argue it has completely changed the incentive structure for Putin's top officials. Most of these individuals own property far beyond their official levels of income, signaling a range of corrupt deals. In turn, these security officials have less incentive to give actual expert advice, which could disappoint Putin and lose them access to their sweet kickbacks. And as mentioned before, poor training and an inflexible command structure compounds these issues. As Phillips O'Brien, professor of strategic studies at University of St. Andrews, has written, though much was made of the flashy new equipment, such as the much-hyped Su-34 strike aircraft, the Russian Air Force continues to suffer from flawed logistics operations and the lack of regular realistic training. Above all, the autocratic Russian kleptocracy does not trust low-ranking and middle-ranking officers and so cannot allow the imaginative, flexible decision-making that NATO air forces rely upon. So, when Russian pilots actually have a chance to act flexibly and change their attacks to hit something, bad commanders and rigid doctrine do not allow them to improvise. Instead, they have to try to pull off their standing orders, even if those are likely to fail or lead to their untimely demise from Ukrainian air defenses. It really doesn't look like the situation will get better for the Russian Air Force either. The VKS has shown no sign of changing tactics and seems very hesitant to even use its best jets in the field. This might be because Western sanctions have hit the Russian aerospace industry particularly hard, quickly eroding Russia's ability to obtain the components needed to produce new advanced fighter jets. This became evident in a January call where Putin publicly attacked Denis Mantharov, deputy prime minister and minister of trade and industry. Previously a favorite of Putin, Mantharov was humiliated when he explained that the country was unable to obtain the contracts needed for new parts. One Moscow-based defense analyst even told reporters that you have to ask yourself if Mantarov is going to be the next one of Putin's cronies you read about mysteriously falling out of a window somewhere. But the corruption, sanctions, and mounting losses of aircraft in Ukraine seem to have made actually getting the parts an impossible task. This is pretty obvious when we take a look at Russia's three production facilities for Sukhoi aircraft. Despite their massive size, analysis from last year shows that they only produced 31 aircraft during 2022, falling far short of the orders placed in state defense contracts. Essentially, as Rand Corporation analyst John V. Paracini recently put it, Russia's aerospace sector isn't likely to have aircraft to sell, even if it wants to. At the end of March 2023, Ukraine's Armed Forces General Staff claimed at least 305 aircraft had been destroyed since the start of the war. While Russia has reportedly even resorted to stripping the microchips from household appliances to replace its losses, it isn't nearly enough. 
One Ukrainian defense executive stated that production for some of the most critical subsystems for Russian fighters has almost seized up. Problematic items like the Su-35's Irbis Passive Electronically Scanning Array radar antenna can require a year or more, and that is in times of no embargoes, no supply disruptions. These problems are even greater for Russia's fleet of bombers, such as the Tupolev Tu-95 and Tu-22M3. While Russia has maintained some domestic production capacity for its fighter jets over the years, mainly due to demand from abroad, this isn't the case for bombers. Once the current fleet begins to break down, there is literally no way for Russia to replace them. This is one of the main reasons why many analysts and experts now call Russia's equipment losses in this area irreversible, with no chance of restoring stockpiles to pre-war levels. The situation for Russia's air force is also likely to get worse once Ukraine begins receiving the Western F-16s. Retired U.S. Air Force Lieutenant Colonel Dan Hampton stated in a recent interview that compared to an F-16, the Russian Su-35 is essentially junk, adding that our planes are more durable. I wouldn't bet in combat on the Su-35 or any Russian-made aircraft. F-16s are versatile, multi-role combat aircraft, which come in one- and two-seater models. Since 1979, the F-16 has been continuously upgraded, giving the newer models advanced radar and other capabilities. With a top speed of 1,500 miles per hour, a 33-foot wingspan, and 50-foot length, Hampton points out that the F-16 is very hard to see because it's smaller than most aircraft, especially when it's aimed directly at you. Each also has one M61A1 20mm multi-barrel cannon and can carry six air-to-air -air missiles. While this payload can pack a serious punch, the Russian planes should also be deadly if used correctly. The Su-35 is a twin-engine, single-seat fighter jet which the RAND Corporation has called Russia's signature heavy fighter bomber. While the Su-35 is reportedly faster than the F-16, able to reach Mach 2, it does not have the same powerful active electronically scanned array radar, making it a more vulnerable and obvious target. Colonel Hampton has pointed out that the Su-35 is easy to use, easy to pick up on radar, and easy to shoot at with a long-range missile. Part of this is because it's such a large plane, with a 50-foot wingspan and a length of nearly 70 feet. And as Hampton stated, the Su-35 is a typical Russian machine and looks good, but deep down it's not really that good of a plane. But which jet is actually superior? Well, it really might come down to who is using it. As David Jordan, co-director of the Freeman Air and Space Institute at King's College London pointed out, that on paper, it can be argued that the Su-35 has an edge over the sorts of F-16s the Ukrainians are likely to get, but that doesn't tell the whole story. Like anything else, the effectiveness of each jet will depend largely on its pilot, their training, and the tactics they employ. Seeing as Ukrainians have already held their own so effectively, there is reason to believe this won't change soon. Combined with their use of man pads, Jordan has argued that I would suspect that the F-16s in Ukrainian hands will represent a formidable challenge. Other experts suggest that the context in which a battle occurs will determine how well the F-16s stack up to the Su-35. Retired British Royal Air Force Commodore Andrew Curtis told Newsweek that if it comes to dogfighting, the F-16 is still one of the best in the world. However, the Russian pilots are likely to try and fight a standoff battle using medium and long-range missiles. If they can do this successfully, that may tilt the balance in the Su-35's favor. But regardless, it seems unlikely that Russia will be able to achieve more than the brief localized air superiority it held last year. Since Ukraine's capabilities are only growing, with more and more Western support, there is little chance of Russia making any real gains. With Russia hemmed in by man pads and other surface-to-air systems, and unable to replace or make more of their advanced jets, it seems only a matter of time before Ukraine starts to retake the airspace in its east. So, to sum things up, it has truly been a terrible year for the VKS. The war in Ukraine has exposed its fundamental weaknesses, while sanctions and enormous losses have seriously harmed its future outlook. Unable to even use the advanced jets it currently has correctly, Russia's air force is not likely to see any improvement soon. Ukraine, on the other hand, has been able to adapt and use superior tactics to overcome its numerical weaknesses. Once the Ukrainian air force gets its hands on some F-16s, the tide of war may turn even faster. But what do you think? Why has Russia's air force been failing so badly? And will Ukraine continue to hold its own in the skies? Let us know what you think in the comments below and don't forget to subscribe for more military content. How is Ukraine adapting to the new realities on the battlefield as the war enters its third year?
One of the more important but understated ways is through the use of high-quality decoys to waste Russian drones and ammunition. But what exactly does this approach entail, and is it actually working? Let's dive in. When 2023 began, Western expectations for Ukraine were reaching a crescendo. Successful counteroffensives in Kherson and Kharkiv oblasts in the summer and fall of 2022 had revealed serious weaknesses in the Russian military. As Russia looked like it was exhausting itself trying to capture the minor city of Bakhmut, there were high hopes for a new offensive that would cut the invaders' land bridge to Crimea and deal a heavy military blow to the Russian war machine while imperiling Vladimir Putin's political position at home. Unfortunately for Ukrainians, none of these hopes materialized. The offensive in Zaporizhia, which began in June, failed to even reach its initial objective at the city of Tokmak. Despite the delivery of weapons the Ukrainians long desired, such as Western main battle tanks, cluster bombs, and long-range missiles, such as the Franco-British Storm Shadow and American Attackums. Russia, meanwhile, demonstrated renewed momentum, if slowly, and an ability to absorb punishment. Russia may not be in position to win the war as Putin would have liked when it began, but it's still not lost it. Now as 2024 begins, the pendulum has swung the other way, and Western hopes for Ukraine are starting to ebb, which is one of the reasons why renewed military aid is becoming more and more controversial in the United States. As the prospects for victory look bleaker for Ukraine, the country is again being forced to turn to its wits to give it an extra edge and to adapt to some of Russia's new methods of waging war. In comes the decoy strategy. Let's take a look at these decoys and why they have become such a necessity for both sides. The war in Ukraine has proven that drones have become one of the most important parts of the modern battlefield, confirming the results seen in the conflict between Azerbaijan and Armenia in 2020, when the former used them to completely reverse its traditional military disadvantage. In contrast, Russia paid comparatively little heed to drones when its war began. Its military doctrine heavily emphasizes artillery and tanks. Ukraine's use of drones quickly proved how vulnerable these traditional arms can be when they are improperly supported. Turkish Bayraktar TB2 drones made quick work of slow-moving Russian convoys around Kyiv. In April 2022, these drones reportedly played a role in the sinking of the cruiser Moskva, the flagship of the Russian Black Sea Fleet, by distracting the ship's air defense systems and providing targeting information for the Ukrainian Neptune missiles which delivered the killing blows. Later, Ukraine proved the metal of smaller, cheaper, first-person view FPV drones controlled by an operator wearing a headset. These drones can provide surveillance and coordinates for artillery and act as loitering munitions in a kamikaze role. Ukraine has taken out many of Russia's armored assets using these devices, including some of the few BMPT Terminator tanks that it has deployed in the war. Other innovative uses of drones included outfitting them with Cold War-era anti-tank grenades, guided by 3D-printed fins, or even converting old anti-aircraft guns into anti-personnel weapons with the assistance of drone targeting. However, as the Ukrainians invested in their drone forces, Russia gradually realized its vulnerability in this area, especially as it had fewer ballistic and cruise missiles to call upon in the wake of Western sanctions. To that end, Russia began investing heavily in purchases of Iranian Shahed 136 drones as 2022 went on. It was the start of a trend. As the war enters its third year, Russia is gradually gaining superiority in drone warfare and this has serious implications for some of Ukraine's most valuable military assets. Russia now reportedly produces between 330 and 350 Shahed drones on a monthly basis. According to Vadim Skibitsky, the second-in-command at Ukraine's defense intelligence, Russia is reported to have produced over 22,000 of them through 2023. The Shahed 136 is a loitering munition that entered service in 2021. It's relatively small, with a 3.5-meter length and 2.5-meter wingspan. It has a total weight of 200 kilograms and can carry a warhead between 36 and 50 kilograms in weight. Its range is between 1,000 and 2,500 kilometers, with a service ceiling of four. Its main role is as an attack arm against stationary ground targets according to preset coordinates. It has no remote control. The drone is launched from a rack of five. As the intensity of Russian missile bombardments began to wane, the Shahed 136 increasingly took to the skies. Between January and March 2023, near the height of Russia's attacks on Ukraine's civilian power grid, missiles of various types made up about 60% of the ammunitions, with Shahed drones making up the remaining 40. Between April and June of 2023, the number reversed. Shahed drones made up 60% of air attacks and missiles the remaining 40. 
Although these drones are not nearly as fast or capable, they are much cheaper, and the arrival of the Shahed and other kamikaze loitering munitions on the battlefield heralds the coming of an era where the cost of precision strikes will be much lower than they were in the past. Russia is further adapting the Shahed-136. Toward the end of 2023, Ukraine was hit with waves of these devices that have stealth modifications to help them better infiltrate Ukrainian air defenses. Ukrainian officials downplayed these modified Shahed drones, claiming only that their new black color made them less visible to the naked eye. However, defense officials quietly admitted that this black material was at least partially radar absorbent. The material improves on the Shahed's stealthy design where the body merges into the wing. This coating, likely founded on carbon-based stealth paint, makes these newer Shahed drones more difficult for Ukrainian radars to detect, especially when they are flying close to the ground as they were designed to do. In addition to large Shahed drones, Russia has also geared up its procurement of smaller FPV drones. In May 2023, a Russian state-owned defense company announced that it will be making at least 3,000 FPV drones per month. Russia also began ramping up production of FPV drones through volunteer groups, which were capable of making thousands of drones per month as well. Ukraine once had an advantage in FPV drones, but that advantage started to dwindle throughout 2023. In November, Ukrainian FPV drone pilots fighting in Donetsk Oblast began claiming that Russia was now fielding them in greater numbers than their own side. Their drones are always in the air, day and night. We can see they've implemented serial production of drones for reconnaissance, surveillance and for strikes," claimed a Ukrainian drone platoon commander in the area while speaking to Reuters under his codename Comrade. According to Comrade, the Russians now have twice the number of FPV drones as Ukraine's troops, at least in the Bakhmut area. Comrade was far from the only soldier saying this. Ukraine's forces began complaining about a lack of FPV drones as 2023 wound down. Another drone operator in the area, who went by the codename Yizak, said that it had now become a common occurrence to only have two or three drones to use against 10 identified targets. Russia's greater investment in FPV drones has exposed vulnerabilities in Ukrainian provision methods. While the Ukrainian government has funded the manufacture of larger, higher-flying, longer-range drones to conduct surveillance and priority assault missions, it has not done the same with the smaller, tactical-level FPV drones. Instead, the Ukrainian armed forces have procured these devices from civic organizations and the donations of private individuals. Often, Ukrainian soldiers themselves will pay for the drones. Russia's greatly increased drone capability means that it now has better surveillance than it did before the start of the war. Russia has increased its capabilities in other ways as well. Ammunition shortages have forced Russia to rely less on World War II-style saturation fire methods with its artillery. By the start of 2023, Russia had reduced its volume of artillery fire by 75% from the wartime high seen in the spring and summer of 2022. To compensate for the shortage, Russia got smarter about how to use its artillery. Instead of its usual methods, Russia has adapted to using Krasnopol laser-guided 152mm artillery shells to deliver more accurate strikes on Ukrainian artillery and defensive positions. According to a report by the Royal United Services Institute, by May 2023, the Russians were using their new shells in conjunction with Lancet loitering munitions to better target Ukrainian artillery and other important equipment. For the Ukrainians, adapting to these changes has proven challenging. In 2022, they were the masters of precision strikes with HIMARS and their superiority in drone warfare. While Russia's attacks were comparatively uncoordinated, that advantage waned significantly the following year and was one of the reasons why the offensive in Zaporizhia proved so disappointing for Ukraine and its Western allies. Russia's improved ability to conduct precision warfare thanks to its emphasis on drones and its increased use of laser-guided artillery has forced the Ukrainian armed forces to find adaptations of their own. One of the methods seems like it could come right out of World War II, when the Allies used dummy vehicles and artillery to confuse the Nazi war planners, especially in the build-up to the D-Day invasion on June 6, 1944. In September 2023, Ukrainian forces released footage of one of Russia's Shahed drones diving towards what looked like an air defense system. The drone barely missed its target, exploding in a large fireball a few meters away. However, even if the loitering munition had found its mark, it would have been in vain, because the supposed air defense system was a dummy. Ukraine's dummy equipment includes much more than air defense systems. A report for CNN also showed a dummy American towed howitzer made up of modified drain pipes. These are far from the only dummy weapons that Ukraine has put into service. 
Ukraine's HIMARS systems have long been a high-priority target for Russia. None of them have yet been damaged, however. This success comes partially because HIMARS is designed to be difficult to target because of its high mobility. Nevertheless, the Ukrainians are taking no chances. Kyiv has manufactured units of wooden, replica HIMARS. These decoys are then attached to wooden trucks and hang around near the front. The presence of these replicas serves to confuse the enemy and protect the real launchers. Ukraine was fielding these dummies as early as the summer of 2022, when precision HIMARS attacks on high-value Russian targets began to change the tempo of the war. Tanks are another arm which the Ukrainians have made decoys of. These decoys are often made of collapsible wood and extremely lifelike. Anton Goroshenko, an advisor to the Ukrainian government, said in an interview with The Economist that one would not be able to tell that these devices are dummies even from a distance of 5 meters. Ukraine has also taken a page right out of the playbook of the D-Day preparations. Part of those preparations included creating a fake army with inflatable equipment, codenamed Operation Fortitude. Wood replicas work, but they come at the cost of being heavy and harder to maintain. Vehicles are needed to transport them, and a lot of valuable labor time is spent assembling and disassembling them. By contrast, inflatable decoys are cheaper and can sometimes be carried by a single man, allowing them to deploy much more rapidly. However, these dummy vehicles are also far more sophisticated than their World War II-era ancestors. One of Ukraine's suppliers for its inflatable dummies, a Czech company called Inflatech, uses flexible reflectors which simulate the heat of a gun that has just fired its projectile. These dummies are even capable of producing radar signatures. The products seem to be working, because Inflatech has seen its business increase by 30% since the start of the Russian invasion. Inflatech's offerings include 30 different products, ranging from tanks, armored vehicles, aircraft, artillery, and large weapons. They are typically made from light materials such as artificial silk, which will keep their weight low. 100 kilogram weights are common for its products. The decoys are usually operated by a team of four soldiers and can be unwrapped or inflated within 10 minutes. Tanks are far from the only devices which can be simulated with inflatables. Artillery, mortars, and even machine guns are capable of being replicated in this way. One of the biggest values of the dummy weapons comes in their cost to manufacture, compared against their cost to destroy. To illustrate, Iranian Shahed drones are extremely cost-effective. They typically cost between $20,000 and $50,000 apiece. By October 2022, it had cost Ukraine more to shoot down the drones than it had cost Russia to launch them. Russia spent a range of $11.6 to $17.9 million on these operations. Ukraine spent about $28 million countering them. Russia's increased use of drones since then adds to the financial pressure. The CNN report pointed out that a real towed howitzer could cost $2 million to $4 million apiece. Tanks can cost even more. A modern Abrams tank can cost up to $10 million. A Leopard can cost $6 million and a Challenger can cost about $5 million. A HIMARS system costs about $5 million apiece. Meanwhile, each GM LRS rocket that can be loaded into HIMARS can cost $100,000 apiece. Attackums missiles, which are also loaded into HIMARS, can cost $1.3 to $1.7 million each, depending on the range and guidance system. There are many other expensive pieces of equipment that are high-priority targets for Russia's much cheaper drone forces. The dummy howitzer, on the other hand, costs only $1,000, which puts the overall math into perspective. The inflatable dummies from Inflatech can be much more expensive. The products the company makes for training purposes can cost $100,000 apiece. This is more expensive than many of Russia's drones, but even if these are destroyed, they are much more expendable than losing a real tank, artillery piece, or air defense system. And the decoys have proven effective in their purpose of depleting Russian ammunition. As early as the summer of 2022, before Russia started to ramp up its drone capabilities, Ukraine was deploying the wooden replica HIMARS systems. That summer, Defense Minister Shoigu personally ordered Ukraine's HIMARS units to be a priority after they had demonstrated their effectiveness against critical Russian military infrastructure. Moscow has repeatedly bragged about destroying these systems. At one point, Shoigu and other Russian commanders announced that a new successful strike had been conducted on HIMARS or other Western rocket artillery systems almost on a weekly basis. An American diplomat commented in a Washington Post report from that time about Russia's braggadocio. They've claimed to have hit more HIMARS than we've even sent. Although Russia has long had a history of inflating its combat performance, the Post noted that the Ukrainian decoys probably accounts for some of the confusion. George Barros, a military researcher at the Institute for the Study of War, commented, If the Russians think they hit a HIMARS, they will claim they hit a HIMARS. 
Russian forces very well may be overstating their battle damage assessments after hitting HIMARS decoys. In the first year of the war, these decoys proved particularly effective at degrading Russian combat effectiveness. Russia was using its missiles far more frequently in those days, and according to Ukrainian officials, the Russian armed forces had indeed wasted expensive caliber cruise missiles on the dummies. Each expensive missile used on a fake HIMARS represented a massive drain on resources for the Russian war machine. It's an excellent example of the asymmetric warfare that Ukraine has needed to practice against its larger enemy. Ukraine has other options to make HIMARS decoys too. Inflatech specializes in making reproductions of Soviet-era equipment. However, it has since put inflatable HIMARS replicas into its product line. This might be one of the reasons why the company's CEO, Wojtek Fresser, expects to see double-digit growth for the next three to five years. In the summer of 2022, the company produced about 50 decoys a month. NATO countries are its typical customer, and Fresser did not confirm that his company's products had made their way to Ukraine, but he did say that he could imagine sending an imperiled partner country inflatable decoys. Russia has since been more selective in the way that it deploys its missiles, but the decoys are equally effective against drones. The Shahed or Russian-manufactured Lancet drones, despite being comparatively cheap, are much more expensive than many of the Ukrainian decoys, turning the attritional maths against the invader. The use of decoys against cheaper FPV drones is also effective. Although the costs are not as lopsided in this way, the Ukrainians have used decoys as more than cost sinks for their enemy. Decoys confuse surveillance drones and provide false targeting information to Russian artillery, getting them to waste valuable shells and rockets. Decoys also serve in their age-old role of confusing the enemy as to Ukrainian intentions. Russian FPV drones might detect artillery seemingly stationed to fire on a certain position, leaving other positions vulnerable to the real attack. Russia hasn't neglected dummies either, and Moscow has been putting these kinds of decoys into practice for a long time prior to the war in Ukraine. In September 2023, a drone-captured video circulating on social media, purportedly by Ukraine's 116th Mechanized Brigade, showed inflatable Russian T-72 tanks. The brigade warned Ukraine's armed forces to be careful about how they use their ammunition in response to these decoys. Russian forces have also been known to use dummies of fighter jets like the MiG-31 and the S-300 missile system. The Russians have used more extensive decoys as well, creating simulated radar stations. New technology has made decoys a much more expensive acquisition than that seen in the past. No World War II-style decoy would fool modern surveillance systems. High-resolution infrared and thermal imaging can easily spot fakes. As we mentioned before, modern decoys manufactured by companies like Inflatech mitigate some of these disadvantages. But as surveillance of the battlefield becomes easier thanks to ubiquitous drones, both sides in the war are trying to improve their decoys, creating a new type of arms race. In the T-72 example given previously, the Russians attempted to conceal two of the dummies with camouflage materials and some foliage, but because Russia left them out in the open, they were easy to spot as fakes. High-resolution imagery revealed that they were obviously inflated devices, with smooth sides and corners. Even an untrained eye would be able to spot the difference between a real T-72 and the fake seen in these images. One Ukrainian company producing decoy artillery said that in order to trick modern surveillance methods, decoys needed to be covered in nets and surrounded by dugout trenches to produce more of an impression that they are the real devices. Leaving inflated equipment out in the open was insufficient. As 2024 ramps up, both Ukraine and Russia will continue to improve their drone warfare capabilities. With these improvements, both sides will become more adept at finding targets of opportunity. Anti-drone weapons and tactics will see increased development in the long term, but in the short term, expect both sides to use new and improved decoys to try to confuse and deplete the other's ammunition. What improvements do you think will be made to decoy technology? How will both sides continue to adapt to the other's increased ability to conduct low-cost precision strikes? Don't forget to let us know in the comments and make sure to hit the like button and subscribe for more military analysis from military experts. Russia has a massive drone problem. In the last few months, dozens of drone strikes and mysterious explosions inside Russian territory suggest that Ukraine is growing more and more capable. But what do these tell us about where the war is headed and how it might end? Let's take a look at what some military experts around the world have to say. First, it's important to understand some context around the recent surge of drone strikes. Both Russia and Ukraine have been stocking up on drones since the invasion began. 
Russia has purchased thousands of so-called Sahed Kamikaze drones from Iran, which it has used to launch attacks on Ukrainian infrastructure and power grids. But Ukraine has also received thousands of drones from foreign suppliers, which it began using to retaliate against Russia late last year. These include the deadly Turkish-produced Bayraktar TV-2, which can fly up to 138 miles per hour, carry a 330-pound payload, and engage in intelligence, reconnaissance, and armed missions. Ukraine has also received hundreds of smaller, but still lethal switchblade drones from the United States. Another kamikaze-style drone, Ukraine has received two varieties. One is the Switchblade 300, meant to hit smaller targets with a range of up to 6 miles. It weighs only about 5.5 pounds and can fly for up to 15 minutes. Meanwhile, the Switchblade 600 is intended for use against larger targets such as tanks or armored vehicles. It weighs about 50 pounds and can fly for up to 40 minutes with a range of 25 miles. A third variety are the little-known Phoenix Ghost drones, also supplied by the US, which are similar to switchblades but with enhanced targeting capabilities. Back in December, Pentagon spokesman John Kirby stated that we believe that this particular system would very nicely suit their needs, particularly in eastern Ukraine. It was developed for a set of requirements that very closely match what the Ukrainians need right now in Donbass. Finally, Ukraine has also been heavily utilizing the DJI Mavic 3, a small, commercial drone which soldiers have used primarily for locating attacks from Russia and lack advanced capabilities. They can only fly a distance of fewer than 19 miles and can only fly for about 46 minutes. Collectively, all these drones have proven incredibly valuable to Ukrainian forces, allowing them to take the fight to Putin in unexpected ways. The latest examples of this are a series of attacks on Russia which experts suggest are shaping operations. A standard part of modern military practice, these range from symbolic strikes to more significant attacks, all designed to keep an enemy off balance and confused, shaping their mindset before a major offensive. John Spencer, a former U.S. Army major who chairs urban warfare studies at the Modern War Institute at West Point, stated that they are Ukrainian gray zone operations that require Russia to expend resources, be that troops or information operations. They're like a magician's sleight of hand. They deceive the viewer and force his attention elsewhere. Drone strikes have become a major part of this strategy by demonstrating Russian vulnerability and sowing confusion among commanders and soldiers alike. In May, two drones exploded above the Kremlin itself, with several more blowing up above Moscow later that month. Mike Martin, a former British Army officer and author of How to Fight a War, recently said, the idea is to create a lot of dilemmas for the Russian command structure, and that Ukraine is using the Russian playbook against Russia. The first of these attempted drone attacks actually took place all the way back in December, when Russian air defenses shot down a Ukrainian drone over Engels Air Base, with the falling debris killing three soldiers. The base is located roughly 400 miles northeast of Ukraine's border and is home to Russian bombers which have carried out numerous attacks. This was an early indication that Ukraine had begun to pivot to drone warfare, allowing it to take the conflict back across Russia's border. The Ukrainian military did not officially admit to the attack, but Air Force spokesman Yuri Anat said the explosions were the result of what Russia was doing on Ukrainian soil. According to Russian media reports, there have been more than 60 of these suspected drone strikes during 2023, mostly in the Bryansk and Belgorod regions in Russia, near the northeastern border with Ukraine, as well as in Russian annexed Crimea. The primary targets have been oil facilities, airfields, and energy infrastructure, all crucial to maintaining Putin's war machine. Leila Guest, an analyst at Civilian Security Consultancy, told the BBC that Ukrainian forces will highly likely prioritize targeting oil refineries, as well as railway infrastructure and wider Russian logistics to cause maximum disruption as part of their strategy ahead of the impending counteroffensive. The attacks have also made it clear to Moscow that Ukraine now has the capabilities to strike deep inside Russia itself potentially giving Putin and his top supporters pause. David Senciotti, editor of the noted aviationist blog, noted that although Ukraine has not confirmed that its armed forces carried out the attacks on Moscow, I think that the preemptive raids we've seen in the last year prove that Ukraine has the capability to launch long-range attacks of that kind from within Ukrainian territory. Across the same period, Ukraine has rapidly increased its production and acquisition of new drones to meet its soldiers' growing demand. Along with appeals to Western allies, Zelensky's government has relaxed import laws and scrapped taxes for drone parts and equipment. 
Previously, such rules meant that receiving parts like GPS modules or thermal cameras could take 15 days. At the same time, Ukraine also changed its tax code rules, so importers of drones do not pay import duty and VAT for drones and their components. The massive expansion of the drone program has been funded by a successful fundraising campaign called the Army of Drones, which has raised more than $108 million with the help of celebrity supporters like Star Wars' Mark Hamill. And the money isn't just going toward buying and building new drones for the war effort, but also on providing their operators with advanced training. Recently, reporters from the BBC were invited to one of the secretive training sessions for drone pilots. They described more than a dozen teams of pilots flying small drones across a field, searching for markers resembling military targets, all while an instructor gave them tips for staying hidden in the woods. The instructor, going only by the moniker Slava, said that drones are our eyes. We can see the occupier very well from the top, so we can adjust artillery and find and neutralize the enemy. And organizers from the Army of Drones campaign say they have built or purchased an extra 3,300 drones since the effort began last July. Some 400 people have even sent their own hobby drones to Ukrainian troops in the mail, and soon, they're likely to have even more of them. Ukraine's Minister for Digital Transformation, Mikhailo Fedorov, has boasted of a Ukrainian drone called the R-18 that can fly from Kyiv to Moscow and back. Although Fedorov denied he was calling for drone strikes on Russia, he claimed that we have defense forces who plan operations and our task is to do everything we can so that the country has enough UAVs for them to be used for all military purposes. So, what exactly are these military purposes? Well, it's pretty clear that one major goal is to keep Russia's war planners from getting too comfortable. Back in March, multiple drones making it past Russian air defenses led authorities to close the airspace around St. Petersburg, halting all departures and arrivals at the main airport, Pulkovo, while Ukrainian drone strikes on the Russian border regions of Bryansk and Belgorod were a regular occurrence in early 2023, this was the first attack which reflected a more ambitious effort, and it set many Russian supporters of the war on edge, making it clear that the violence triggered by their invasion is finally reaching Russia proper. Andrei Medvedev, a commentator with Russian state television who serves as a deputy speaker of Moscow's city legislature and runs a popular blog about the war, claimed that the strikes of exploding drones on targets behind our lines will be part of the coming offensive. Another former top military official, Viktor Alksnis, noted that the drone attacks marked the expansion of the conflict and criticized Putin for failing to deliver a stronger response. During May and June, the frequency and severity of these drone attacks increased yet again. Military analyst and retired U.S. Major General James Spider Marks told CNN, that the drone strikes are hugely important for Ukraine's counteroffensive. He noted that until now, Russians in the border areas have had sanctuary where they can go back, they can refit, reorganize, rest, refuel, etc., so they're able to prepare for engagements. When you're in sanctuary, that gives you all the advantages, but when you have no ability to rest, no ability to refuel, and you're back there and being attacked, that reduces your ability to concentrate forces going forward. That goes for both material and psychological readiness, where Russian troops have already been lacking for the past year. So these are the deep fires which are essential to achieve that operational maneuver," added Marx. If the Ukrainians can continue to apply pressure across the border into the sanctuary areas where the Russian forces are, it will limit the number of Russian forces and it will give an advantage to the Ukrainians to achieve that level of success. This is a critical step to keep Russia from holding the hundreds of miles of fortified trenches it has dug across eastern Ukraine, a vital element of the coming counterattack. If Ukrainian forces can use drones to halt the supply lines and reinforcements, it will allow room for their artillery, tanks, and infantry to press forward. As Marx put it, this is synchronization that we probably haven't seen at this level yet. There's a difference between tactical success and operational victories. You have to have the volume of forces to tie tactical victories together and achieve this penetration. Then you can hold on one side and reduce in that direction. If Ukraine follows this strategy, it suggests that the counteroffensive will use the drone strikes to cut a swath through Russian lines, potentially retaking large pieces of territory without air superiority. The increasingly frequent use of such tactics was highlighted again at the beginning of June, when drones struck two oil refineries in southern Russia causing authorities to transfer more troops to several border areas in hopes of shoring up their defensive lines. As the Wall Street Journal reported, 
Authorities in Russia's Krasnodar region said the Ilyinsky oil refinery was largely unaffected by a suspected drone attack, but a blaze at the Afipsky refinery engulfed over 1,000 square feet of territory, likely as the result of a drone, according to regional governor Vinyamin Kondratyev. Then, at nearly the same time, a wave of drones struck residential buildings in Moscow, including several which hit the Rublyovka district, housing the city's political and business elite, and only miles from Putin's official Nova Ogaryova residence. While Putin and Russian Defense Minister Sergei Shoigu called the attacks terrorism against peaceful Russian citizens, Ukrainian officials dismissed such comparisons. Major General Kyrylo Budanov stated that all of those who have tried to frighten us dreaming that it would bring some kind of effect, you will regret it very soon. We won't make you wait for our response, all will see it very soon. While casualties were low, it's likely that Ukraine is using its inexpensive drones to test out Russian air defenses for future action. Russia's defense ministry said the attack used eight fixed-wing drones, five of which were shot down by its Pantsir air defenses. Three were deflected from their targets by radio electronic defenses. Still, Moscow is some 280 miles from the Ukrainian border, meaning that the drones were able to move undetected for significant periods of time. Western officials say such attacks are a strong signal that the conflict has veered away from any scenario desired by the Kremlin. In a statement, the UK Defense Ministry noted that since the start of May 2023, Russia has increasingly ceded the initiative in the conflict and is reacting to Ukrainian action rather than actively progressing toward its own war aims. It's also becoming clear that the threat from Ukraine's drone attacks is really messing with Putin and his cronies. In a televised address, he boasted the Russian air defenses had been effective, but also that they had some room for improvement. Others were far more direct. Yevgeny Prigozhin, head of the Wagner paramilitary group, criticized the Russian defense ministry for failing to keep its citizens in the capital safe, posting on Telegram that, you've done nothing to attack, why the f have you allowed drones to fly into Moscow? Other cracks began to show among public supporters who Putin has relied on to maintain support for his disastrous invasion. A top pro-war Telegram blogger who goes by the handle Rybar raged that if the goal of the assault was to stress out the population, then the fact of Ukrainian drones appearing in the skies over Moscow has done enough of that already. A senior anonymous Ukrainian official seemed to confirm that psychological distress was the main objective of any operation that might be taking place, stating that a successful offensive starts with a successful psychological offensive. Their Russian morale is not at its highest level, and their borders are not impenetrable. It also seems as though Ukraine's drone strikes are meant to make the general Russian population feel fear and discomfort, similar to what Ukrainians have dealt with for the last year. One attack on a power station near the Ukrainian border left days-long blackouts in two Russian villages. By doing so, Ukrainian operators may also hope to expose residents to even more Russian government incompetence, as local authorities struggle to repair damage to the substations. Yet the Ukrainian strategy may prove to be something of a double-edged sword. Western officials remain very nervous at the prospect of Ukraine striking inside Russia itself and potentially escalating the conflict. The US has remained Ukraine's main benefactor, recently announcing another $300 million in military aid to Ukraine, including Patriot munitions and other air defense equipment, more artillery and tank shells, and other equipment including mine clearing systems. That brings overall US security assistance to more than $37.6 billion since the start of the invasion. But as reporters from the Wall Street Journal have pointed out, continued attacks inside Russia, if carried out by Ukraine, threaten to raise tensions with Washington, which has urged Kyiv not to carry out strikes on Russian soil or potentially discourage the transfer of more advanced aid by other Western partners. This is a sentiment echoed by US officials themselves, who have stressed that their weapon transfers are intended only for defensive operations. White House Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre recently told reporters that we've been gathering information about exactly what happened. We do not support attacks inside of Russia, period. At the same time, however, she also noted that the Biden administration remained committed to providing Ukrainians with the equipment and training necessary to retake their own sovereign territory. Authorities from Germany, another of Ukraine's major Western supporters, offered similar concerns. One senior German official told the journal that the drone attacks raised major concerns about the potential supply of weapons, such as Taurus missiles, to Ukraine. Such long-range weapons would make it even easier for Ukrainian forces to strike at Moscow, which Germany has said 
It does not want to happen. It's also possible that the escalating violence inside Russia's borders could change the calculus for the country's tacit supporters such as China, which has so far avoided sending any lethal aid to Putin. This means that Zelensky's government is left playing a delicate balancing act when it comes to drone strikes in Russian territory. Many officials likely see them as the best way to prime the battle space for a counteroffensive, but worry about going too far and losing the enormous international support they've enjoyed so far in the war. Their current solution, it appears, is twofold. They've so far avoided using the drones given by NATO countries, relying on independently obtained or built models. Similarly, top officials are apparently continuing to conduct the strikes while officially distancing themselves from any attribution. Ukrainian presidential adviser Mikhailo Podolyak, for instance, publicly denied that Kyiv was behind the attacks. In an online interview, he stated that, We certainly enjoy watching and predicting more attacks, but we certainly don't have a direct involvement. Ukrainian Air Force spokesman Yuri Ignat also dismissed the official allegations, claiming that these are their internal problems. They'll have more and more such problems. A spokesperson for the Ukrainian security services told the press, that we will comment on the instances of cotton only after our victory, he said. Quoting the head of the security service, Vasil Maliuk, the spokesperson added that regardless, cotton has been burning, is burning, and will continue burning. Cotton is a common Ukrainian slang term for explosions. It seems as though Ukraine is likely relying more heavily on covert measures in order to distance themselves from the attacks and also avoid Russian air defenses. According to a recent investigation by CNN, U.S. intelligence officials believe that Ukraine has cultivated a network of agents and sympathizers inside Russia, working to carry out acts of sabotage against Russian targets and has been providing them with drones to stage attacks. These espionage agents may have been behind many of the more improbable drone strikes, such as those on Moscow, acting from deep inside Russian lines. One European intelligence official told reporters that because the Russo-Ukrainian border is so vast, and difficult to control, it is an ideal location for smugglers to operate. You also have to consider that this is a peripheral area of Russia, the official said. Survival is everyone's problem, so cash works wonders. It's unclear exactly who is controlling the funding and operations, but it is most likely being managed indirectly through Ukrainian intelligence agents without requiring constant authorization by Zelensky to preserve deniability. And these operations also appear to have been planned far in advance, as they build on the mysterious fires and explosions inside Russia over the last year, which have targeted oil and fuel depots, railways, military enlistment officers, warehouses, and pipelines. Now that the frequency is increasing, one U.S. intelligence official said, the current push is a culmination of months of effort. There have been, for months now, a pretty consistent push by some in Ukraine to be more aggressive, the individual added and there has certainly been some willingness at senior levels. The challenge has always been their ability to do it. Leaked documents from several months ago seem to confirm this, as Zelensky suggested striking Russian deployment locations in Russia's Rostov Oblast using drones, since Ukraine lacked the long-range weapons to do so. Even so, despite the public hesitation by Western officials, in private many have struck a different tune. Some related that they believe the cross-border attacks are a smart military strategy that could divert Russian resources to protecting its own territory. Others have been more overt with their praise, such as UK Foreign Secretary James Cleverly, who told reporters that Ukraine has the right to project force beyond its borders to undermine Russia's ability to project force into Ukraine itself. Legitimate military targets beyond its own borders are internationally recognized as being part of a nation's self-defense we should recognize that. French Vice Admiral Nicolas Vaujour expressed similar thoughts, telling CNN that Ukraine's actions are not forbidden, and that there is a war there, and it could concern you, the Russian public, in the future. And so it's a good way for Ukrainians to address a message not only to Vladimir Putin, but to the Russian population. All things considered, it doesn't seem likely that Ukraine will stop its drone strikes on Russia anytime soon, as the strategy has forced Russian military planners to worry about their own necks for a change. But what do you think? Will the drone strikes allow Ukraine to mount a successful counteroffensive, or will the escalation lead to a decline in Western support? Let us know what you think in the comments below, and don't forget to subscribe for more military content and analysis. Whichever way you assess the war in Ukraine these days, you'll probably be left wondering the same thing as everyone else. What on earth has happened? 
to Putin's infamous Air Force. Fighter jets like this supersonic medium-range fighter-bomber aircraft, the Su-34, or this Su-57, a multi-role fighter capable of aerial combat as well as ground and maritime strikes, should be dominating the skies over Ukraine. But instead, they're either seen fleeing the battlefield or ungracefully falling onto the ground in flames. Try as they might, Russian combat aviators have failed to establish any kind of air superiority over the battlefield thus far. Today, we'll take a look at a few reasons why, starting with something called manpads. Don't be fooled by the name, these things have Putin's aircraft retreating left and right, and a quick dive into one of the most revolutionary periods in the history of military air power, the Jet Age. The coming of the Jet Age in the late 1940s ushered in profound changes in the field of aeronautics. Jets could fly faster, climb higher, and travel farther than their piston-powered predecessors, feats that would forever transform the commercial aviation industry. They would have major implications for military air power too. Jet propulsion was supposed to make air power king. If you could outrun the enemy in the skies, you could theoretically enjoy unfettered air superiority over the battlefield. At least that was the idea. Sound-shattering increases in aircraft speeds motivated designers to swap traditional guns for air-to-air -air missiles, their only hope of ever shooting a supersonic jet out of the sky. Missiles not only remain the preferred weapon for air-to-air -air combat, but revolutionize the very nature of air defense itself. Today, air defenses rely almost exclusively on surface-to-air missile systems, or SAMs, to prevent hostile air attacks. Impressively, technological advances in the 1970s made it possible to furnish vulnerable infantry with their own portable handheld anti-aircraft missiles too. Man-portable air defense systems, or MANPADs, are simple and cost-effective shoulder-fired rockets that lock onto aircraft using infrared homing. They can be taught to new users in a matter of a few minutes. Useful, right? Putin thought so too. Knowing Russia's numerically superior air force would play a central role in the opening phases of its invasion of Ukraine back in February of 2022, Western nations rushed thousands of manpads into Ukrainian hands to shore up their air defenses. These included American Stinger missiles, surplus Soviet eyeglass, and British laser-guided high-velocity Starstreak systems. The gamble paid off. Cheap manpads made it much harder for Russia's air force to establish aerial supremacy, imposing steep, asymmetrical costs on Russian pilots who could no longer safely approach priority targets in Ukrainian airspace. For the price of one $60,000 to $80,000 Eigla, Ukrainian soldiers can down a $36 million Su-34 bomber or an $85 million Sukhoi Su-35S fighter. That's real bang for your buck. This has had real repercussions all over the battlefield. Modern combined arms warfare hinges on effective cooperation between all service branches air, armor, artillery, and infantry. Because Russia has thus far been unable to provide active, continuous air cover for its ground units, tanks, logistic convoys, artillery, and infantry have been repeatedly caught out in the open and destroyed over the course of the war, a spectacle played out almost daily in combat footage littering social media for the entire world to see. Here's the bad news, though. Despite Putin's failure to establish air dominance in Ukraine, this does not mean that Russian aircraft are not present over the battlefield or that Ukraine enjoys its own air superiority. Far from it. In a recent interview, Ukrainian troops on the front lines around Bakhmut told reporters that Russian aircraft still fly over the battlefield almost every day, sometimes a few times each day. But manpads have drastically reduced the extent to which they can linger over their targets. Here's how it usually goes down. Most overflights last only a few seconds. Fighter bombers flying in pairs or groups of four ingress to a target area at low altitude, maybe 50 meters or less, and then lob rockets and bank left or right and return back to base. Rather than hover over the front, far slower helicopters tend to operate similarly as airborne artillery platforms, approaching the contact line, firing their salvos of unguided rockets, and departing as quickly as possible. This has made it even harder for Ukrainian infantry to shoot down Russian aircraft. Constant vigilance is required since little warning is given. One soldier provided insight into the process. When the infantry shouts, incoming, and hides in the trenches, you have to run out and try to find the enemy's plane or aircraft. It doesn't matter if the enemy is shelling you or if it's calm. Your response has to be highly focused. 
and you have to have perfect sight and hearing to find a target at a distance of 3 to 5 kilometers. From the moment you've heard the sound, you literally have 3 to 5 seconds to run up and throw the man pads on your shoulder. Since timing is everything, concealed Ukrainians tend to target slower Su-20 fighter bombers and helicopters like the Mi-8. Hefting an 18kg Eigler onto your shoulder while sprinting out to the open and get a lock while the target zips overhead, then launching the missile knowing you're in mortal danger all within a span of 15 seconds or less, can you imagine how difficult that must be? The decentralization of air defense made possible by man pads like the Stinger has helped limit the effectiveness of Russian air power, but it hasn't blunted it altogether. According to former Staff Sergeant and Green Beret David Bramlett, a combat veteran who recently spent 11 months fighting the Russians in Ukraine, Russia could still turn things around if Western support wavers. Let's hope that doesn't happen, but even if it does, there's a chance Putin will take care of his air army's downfall all by himself. You see, lucky for Ukraine, Russia also has its own incompetence to thank in part for its lack of air superiority. Recently, accidents have taken their toll on Russian aircraft, with six crashes alone registered over the span of two months in late 2022. In September, a Russian Air Force Su-25 attack aircraft crashed just after takeoff after entering a left turn. Experts believe the crash was likely due to a technical fault or a pilot error. The pilot did not eject. A month later, an Su-25 fighter bomber careened into the courtyard of an apartment building in Yesk, a western port on the Sea of Azov, during a training flight after its pilot ejected. The devastating crash injured 25 and killed at least 15 civilians, three of them children. According to Russian state media, the accident was caused by an engine fire sustained during takeoff. Just a week later, another Su-30 fighter entered a vertical dive and smashed into a two-story residential home in Siberia, killing its two pilots in a fiery explosion. It was the second such fatal incident in six days involving a Sukhoi fighter plane. No civilians were killed. But the crashes don't end there, and they are happening on a wider scale than you may know. The avalanche of accidents reflects the toll the war has had on Russian aviation writ large. Reflecting on the aerial crashes, Michael Bonnet, an engineer and analyst at Rand Corporation, noted that what's interesting is that even aircraft not involved in the Russian invasion are crashing. In an interview with Business Insider, he said that while mechanical failures are expected in aircraft over time, a rapid increase in fleet-wide mechanical failures may indicate that something fundamental has changed. So what has changed? The war has placed immeasurable strain on Russian aviation. Colossal losses contributed to Russia's tendency to adopt more risk-averse tactics, playing a subordinate role to Russia's ground troops, according to Guy Plopsky, an Israeli defense analyst and Russian expert. In just eight months, Russian combat aviators flew on average 150 sorties a day for a total of 34,000 combat sorties, but the number of sorties has greatly diminished. From an early high of 300 per day, Britain's Ministry of Defense estimates that now Russia probably conducts tens of missions per day. Very few of those sorties actually enter Ukrainian airspace. General wear and tear can be expected in any war, but the immense toll has seriously impacted Russia's pool of 7,500 relatively inexperienced pilots, who are said to receive roughly 100 hours of flight time per year, one-third less than their NATO counterparts. The lack of training limits their ability to conduct the type of massive air campaigns Western armies almost take for granted. According to Justin Bronk, an air power analyst, since Russian pilots are trained almost exclusively to fly in pairs and have little exposure to larger exercises, get relatively few flying hours compared to most NATO fighter crews, do not have support from tankers on most operations, and are not doctrinally trained for large air campaigns, it is perhaps unsurprising in retrospect that the Russian Aerospace Forces VKS, proved incapable of conducting a Western-style war against Ukraine. Of a pool of around 300 modernized and 400 other frontline jets, Russia has sustained 72 air losses during the war, each costing tens of millions of dollars. The losses also include pilots, which are difficult to train and even more difficult to replace. Just ask Britain's RAF, itself suffering from a shortage of trained air crews, where it most recently had more F-35 Lightning II fighters than it had pilots amid a five-year waiting list for students to reach the front line. But the lack of qualified pilots is only one part of the problem. Russia also lacks skilled mechanics or the proper tools to make and fix the parts needed to keep Russia's modernized air fleet up to snuff. The fact that its pre-war stockpiles are dilapidated and rapidly diminishing only adds to the problems as the demand for specialized parts and repair tools grows. 
Russia has tried to mobilize greater amounts of manpower to address the human part of the problem, which, as you can imagine, has its own issues. Just like training pilots, you have to train the repair crews to diagnose and maintain extremely complex computer avionics and technical systems. That is, if you can get them. Herein lies another problem with Russia's Air Force. While mobilization certainly affected the small and medium-sized companies that make aviation parts, the random crashes and accidents began happening prior to mobilization. The shortage of manufacturing tools was already going on, which means Western sanctions may have had a role to play. Russia has been left in an economic and industrial vice by the West, squeezed out of its many traditional import-export markets where it has received the critical components it needs to keep its airplanes airworthy. Modern aircraft are outfitted with a deeply complex array of electronic systems. Computer targeting, special sites, communication relays, everything relies on critical electronic components previously available to Russia only on the import market. Moscow has previously admitted that it was 15 years behind the rest of the world, producing its own semiconductors, which isn't a good look when so many of today's precision weapons heavily rely on them. Russian manufacturers are now trying to source the components they need on the black market, but in the interim, Western sanctions and embargoes have forced the Kremlin to crack open stocks of its Soviet-era dumb munitions that lack computer guidance. Cannibalizing older pieces of equipment for spare parts is one way to try and stem the tide of aircraft losses, but it's hardly a good one. The result is an ad hoc, hodgepodge approach to combat aviation, hardly a combination any pilot anywhere should ever want to try. Some cases are pretty bad. It's reported that Russian pilots have been forced to tape commercial GPS devices to their cockpits for navigation, one report claimed. There are reports of Russian air crews being so incompetent they leave the covers on aircraft sensors before takeoff. Another outlet claims their bombing accuracy has a mere 40% success rate compared to the pinpoint precision displayed by Western coalition forces during the campaigns in Syria and Iraq. We don't know exactly how effective Western sanctions have been in dulling Russian air power, but it has certainly played a role in suffocating access to the parts it needs to operate at the top of its game. In a war, every little bit of help goes a long way. There's no out-and-out -out answer as to why Putin has failed to establish air superiority. It is likely that a combination of factors – wear and tear, stress on older airframes, a lack of pilots and trained air crews, and Western sanctions – have each played a significant role. What we do know is that thanks in part to their own outstanding courage, adaptability and resilience coupled with the material support they've received from the West, Ukraine has managed to do a lot with a little in terms of its own air defense. Talks are still ongoing over the feasibility of supplying Ukrainian aviators with Western fighter aircraft. If this were to happen, we shouldn't expect much to change anytime soon. Much like the implementation of Western main battle tanks, it will take months, if not years, to furnish Ukrainian aviators with the tools they need to become truly proficient on unfamiliar systems like the F-16, the Eurofighter Typhoon, the Assault Mirage and other planes. That said, we should never again underestimate the pluck of Ukrainian service members who have a penchant for proving us wrong. Why do you think Russian air power is failing? Let us know in the comments and don't forget to subscribe for more military analysis from military experts. Putin is using Russian ethnic minorities as expendable pawns in his war against Ukraine, and it's horrifying. In Siberia and other remote parts of Russia, funerals are way too common. Cemeteries are filled with soldiers, many of their graves freshly dug. Since Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine, men from these areas, remote, poor, and home to many of the country's minority groups, have endured the heaviest burden of the war and died disproportionately. Where is this going? Will Russian ethnic minorities attempt to call for decolonization of Russia? Let's dive in. Russia is one of the world's largest countries by land area, with a total of 6,601,665 square miles. This territory, which far exceeds that of any other country and which was acquired over centuries of military activity, means that Russia is a diverse nation-state. It counts 160 different ethnic groups, comprising over 100 languages among its citizens. Unfortunately for Russia, relations between the ethnic Russian ruling class and these minority peoples have not always been the best. The war in Ukraine has exacerbated these centuries-old tensions and rekindled them anew. 
When Putin announced his partial mobilization to acquire much-needed reinforcements for his retreating armies in the autumn of 2022, the burden of military service disproportionately fell on the country's poorer and ethnic minority communities from remote areas. The Kremlin announced no official demographic data for the mobilization, but independent sources in Russia used available information to determine the proportion of eligible reservists, which comprise 80% of Russia's men aged 18 to 49 that were drafted in particular areas. This data, cited by The Economist, suggested that of the 26 regions which supplied the largest number of men drafted, 23 of them were below the national average in income. For example, the researchers estimated that 5.5% of eligible reservists were conscripted in Krasnoyarsk Krai, where the average monthly income is about $665. In Moscow, though, with a monthly income that averaged about $1,500, only slightly under 1% of eligible reservists were called to the colors. Krasnoyarsk Krai is a region in Siberia with a population of about 2.5 million people, according to the 2021 Russian census. About 90% of the population in the area is composed of ethnic Russians. But that's not true for all areas of Siberia or in other Russian territories where the military burden has been the heaviest and that poses a problem for the Kremlin. Let's take a look at the history of Russia's relationships with many ethnic minority populations that span its vast territories. What does this history and the relationships between the outer areas and the Russian heartland mean for the war in Ukraine and the future of Russia? For Siberia, the disproportionate military burden stretches far further east than Krasnoyarsk Krai, and it's here where the ethnic tensions mount the most. One example would be the Republic of Buryatia in the Russian Far East. In the declining days of 2022, military recruiters turned a dozen schools in Ulan Uda, the Republic's capital, into conscription centers. Unlike Krasnoyarsk Krai, about 30% of the people in this area come from the ethnic minority Buryats, a Mongolic group. The situation in Buryatia was significant enough that the president of Mongolia, Uknagin Kurulshuk, offered shelter for the Buryats, Tuvans, and Kalmyks in Russia who wanted to avoid conscription. Kurulshuk accused the Russian military of using these people as nothing more than cannon fodder. Other ethnic groups have also been disproportionately targeted for conscription. The Republic of Saka, informally known as Yakutia, is a region in Siberia with a large ethnic minority population. About 55% of the people in this area are Yakuts, also known as Saka, a Turkish ethnic group. In October 2022, local media announced that 4,500 recruits were expected to come from this region. The total population in Yakutia, according to the 2021 Russian census, was about 995,000 people. Pressures have also been high in the Republic of Dagestan in the Caucasus, which is a majority-minority area comprised primarily of Avars, Dargins, Kumiks, and Lesgins. When they came in the declining days of 2022, Russian military recruiters were met with a frosty reception. One video that spread on social media saw local men arguing with a woman from the government. The woman claimed that the area's men should be fighting for their children's future, but one of the locals replied, we don't even have a present, what future are you talking about? Because of the disproportionate share in Russia's armies, ethnic minorities from poorer areas have suffered disproportionate casualties in the war. In a study using Russian figures, the BBC found that of 6,000 soldiers confirmed to be killed in action in Ukraine by September 2022, troops from Dagestan, Buryatia, and Krasnodar, the largest city in Krasnodar Krai in the Northern Caucasus, suffered the greatest share, with over 200 deaths from each of these areas. In contrast, only 15 of those 6,000 deaths came from the Moscow area. As conscripted soldiers have often been sent into the worst enemy fire in battles such as Bakhmut and now Avdivka, often without body armor or proper equipment, we can be sure that many more ethnic minorities from Russia's poorer regions have suffered and died disproportionately in the months since. Units from Russia's eastern military district, which comprises Buryatia and large parts of Siberia, have seen disproportionate action as well even before the wave of mobilization. They took a leading part in the Battle of Kyiv, for example, where Russia's attack stalled and was then thrown back with significant casualties. Russia's ethnic minorities from Siberia and elsewhere have been treated poorly even when they do not become casualties. Hazing is common in the Russian military, and these more vulnerable troops are easy targets. 
Regular army troops have often been accused of stealing valuable equipment and belongings of the conscripts, such as body armor, further inflating the latter's casualty figures. This maltreatment in the military is often indicative of the treatment of ethnic minorities in civil society at large, a maltreatment that goes back centuries. When the Russian Empire began to expand east of the Ural Mountains and into Siberia, it encountered hostile tribes, the ancestors of Russia's ethnic minority groups today. To maintain control over these people and extract the valuable resources Siberia had to offer, the Russian authorities would send Cossack raiders against their villages. Then, the same Russian authorities would offer to protect the tribes from such raids in exchange for valuable commodities, like the thick furs from the fauna of the Siberian wilderness, which they could sell for a fortune in Europe. It was a cynical ploy that allowed for greater incorporation of Siberia into the Russian political structure. The Russian army built a series of forts along the way, supposedly to protect the trade routes. The end result was that the Siberian tribes enriched the Russian Empire that oppressed them on the backs of their own labor in extracting the furs and other resources. Meanwhile, Russia took advantage of the divided nature of Siberia and used the tribes to fight each other to secure its interests. This not only enhanced Russia's rule over Siberia, but it ensured that the tribes would die so that ethnic Russians need not. Sound familiar? To ensure that the tribes would be fighting one another, Russia used its agents to spread divisive propaganda, playing them off against each other. Sound familiar? However, although Russia conquered the isolated, poor, and ill-equipped Siberian people with ease, truly incorporating them into Russian society proved to be a task that was more trouble than it was worth. This was no empire along centralized lines like that seen in Europe, but rather more closely resembled a federal or confederal structure. The Siberian tribes were largely isolated from the centers of Russian political and civil society, and as such had little true connection to the empire. The result was that they maintained their languages and ethnic cultures. In a certain sense, this division was to Russia's advantage. Tribal divisions prevented the Siberian peoples from uniting against the authorities west of the Urals. To maintain this division, all of the roads that Russia built in the vast Siberian wilderness linked back to the heartland in Europe, rather than connecting the tribal villages with each other. This remains the case today. All of these factors amounted to Siberia essentially being Russia's version of an overseas colony. The only meaningful interaction of the tribes with the machinery of the Russian state was to bring their tributes to the trading posts. The entire arrangement was designed to enrich a far-flung motherland at Siberia's expense. It was little different than the Western powers' colonies in the Americas, Africa, and Asia. The treatment of the ethnic minorities in other areas, especially in the Caucasus, mirrored the treatment of the Siberian tribes, but on a grander scale because of the more densely populated regions. Russia's expansion southward into the Caucasus and Central Asia saw many of the same policies it had used in Siberia. The non-ethnic Russians were treated brutally. For example, the Russian Tsar Alexander II is often seen in a positive light for ending serfdom within the empire. However, in 1864, his attempt to expel the Muslim Caucasians from the Caucasus region killed 600,000 people in what is today known as the Caucasian Genocide. Alexander considered this a necessity as these formerly Ottoman territories, which came into the Russian fold in the 1829 Treaty of Adrianople, had proven unwilling to accept the authority of the Tsars or convert from Islam to Russian Orthodox Christianity. Then there was Russia's policy in Crimea. Today, the illegally annexed territory is mostly comprised of ethnic Russians. It was not always so. When Russia first gained control over the peninsula in 1783, the Crimean Tatars, a Turkish Muslim ethnic group, made up 85% of the peninsula's population. Recognizing the strategic importance of the new territory, Catherine the Great decided to remake Crimea's population. She made generous land grants to the Russian nobility and encouraged Russian emigration to the area. The Tatars then gradually began to flee. Those that didn't were in for much worse. After the Russian Empire lost the Crimean War in the 1850s, the Tatars became a convenient scapegoat. The Tatars were forced to abandon their language in favor of Russian. The cleansing of language was so complete that it even applied to road and street names, which were renamed in the Russian tongue. In 1850, just before the Crimean War, about 275 Tatars lived in Crimea. A decade later, that number had been reduced to 194,000. The fall of the Russian Empire and the rise of the Soviet Union should have made the situation better for the country's ethnic minorities. 
After all, communism has inherently egalitarian principles within it. However, these are often not applied in practice, and the Soviet Union was no different. In Crimea, as many as 40,000 Tatars were caught in Stalin's purges. These people were sent to labor camps in Siberia. That was only the beginning of their suffering, however. Stalin accused the Tatars of siding with Germany in World War II. The result was another round of ethnic cleansing. Many were deported to then-Soviet Uzbekistan. Up to half of them died on the journey. They were not allowed to return to Crimea until 1989. After the 2014 annexation, the Tatars were treated the same way, with the Russian government banning language classes and even traditional clothing. Today, though, there are 250,000 Tatars in Crimea, but they only make up about 12% of their historic homeland's population. In Siberia, the situation was much the same. The Soviet Union treated the Siberian tribes and villages as commodities, just as the old empire had, but in a more personal way. In the days of the empire, the authorities in Moscow were more interested in natural resources than people. That changed under the Soviet Union. In World War II, 20% of all people living in Siberia were drafted into the Red Army, placing a disproportionate share of the military burden on these communities. This set a precedent for what would come in the war in Ukraine. In other matters, the Siberian people were also worse off. Under the Russian Empire, the people of Siberia were largely left to their own devices, as long as they were isolated and could not challenge imperial rule. Because this wilderness was not a center of major strategic importance like Crimea or Russia's border in Europe. However, communism has universalism inherent to its political ideology, and the new authorities in Moscow were not content to let Siberian tribes live as they always had. Instead, they adopted an approach similar to the one the earlier Russian Empire had taken in Crimea. The Russian authorities made efforts to suppress the native culture and identity. The nomadic tribes of Siberia were not allowed to remain nomads. Instead, they were forced into communist farming practices. Meanwhile, their children were forced into Soviet schools and encouraged to forget their native language in favor of Russian. The Soviet Union did bring an important change for the tribe's betterment, though. Unlike the empire, which left the tribes scattered and isolated, the Soviets created separate Siberian republics, each with their own laws, officially recognized languages, and other institutions of civic life. For example, the current Saka Republic had its foundation in the early 1920s as a separate socialist republic within the Soviet Union. After the Soviet Union's collapse, this Yakut Autonomous Soviet Socialist Republic was transformed into the current Saka Republic, under the auspices of the Russian Federation. This and other republics, with their ethnic minority populations, were granted significant privileges in the early days of post-Soviet Russia. However, Vladimir Putin's rise to power in 1999 heralded the return of Moscow's historical treatment of its ethnic minorities and outer territories. The destruction of Grozny in the 1999-2000 battle signaled the start of things to come under Putin's reign. After the revolt in Chechnya and carnage in its capital city, the new Russian president made moves to further centralize power. He believed that giving too much local powers to the independent republics within the Russian Federation was asking for trouble. To remedy this, the Kremlin formed the Cossack Commission in 2001. The commission, named for Putin's longtime confidant Dmitry Kozak, was designed to redefine the balance between Moscow and the separate republics and regions. In an interview in July 2000, about six months into his first term as president, Putin mentioned his goal for the commission. I'm prepared to point to several facts, which prove that we live in a state far from the federal ideal. How could one otherwise explain that in some regions there are laws introducing certain rules for entering and staying in the region, or laws that forbid the export of goods to other regions? There have been cases when they have established a special status of the indigenous people in relation to other peoples living in the region, and this is not the Middle Ages. We must, as soon as possible, restore the balance and normal relations between different levels of government. In other words, Putin wanted to claw power back to Moscow, which was the only authority that could restore balance and take it away from Russia's outlying republics, polities, and ethnic groups. The Cossack Commission eventually centralized power in several ways. First, it reasserted the supremacy of federal law. Second, it gave the Russian federal government more ways to take special action against regional governmental bodies. For example, the president of the Russian Federation had the right to remove regional governors from office and dissolve regional parliaments. 
These measures were supposed to come only in special instances, such as when local government bodies made unconstitutional decisions, refused to go along with federal court rulings, or if regional expenditures exceeded their incomes by 30%. However, these procedures are vague enough that in practice, they give the President of the Russian Federation, Putin, a wide berth in potentially interfering in the affairs of the separate Russian republics and other jurisdictions. The Cossack Commission's recommendations were enacted into law on June 25, 2003, and since then, the power of the regional governments has declined sharply, while the power of the Russian presidency has risen. It has gotten to the point that the European Parliament officially considers Russia to be a unitary state rather than a federal one. In October 2015, the body released a document titled Russia's Constitutional Structure – Federal in Form, Unitary in Function. This document accuses Vladimir Putin of concentrating a growing amount of power in his hands while severely constraining the ability of regional governments to make their own policies, even though the Russian constitution supposedly enshrines regional autonomy. The European Parliament's conclusion was that, like the Soviet Union before it, Russia thus functions as a unitary state, despite its constitutional status as a federation. This has proven to be the case in Ukraine. For the Kremlin, placing a disproportionate share of the burden on communities in Siberia and in other poorer regions serves another political purpose. It's keeping the cost of the war away from Russia's more affluent people who are concentrated in Russia's European heartland and in large cities like Moscow. By doing so, the Kremlin has been able to accomplish two objectives. First, it can maintain a large level of public support for the war. Russia's ethnic minorities from small villages in Siberia and elsewhere have far less influence, so as long as the centers of Russian power do not have to pay the cost of the war too heavily, it's easy for them. Secondly, the Kremlin has been able to cover up the full extent of the war's costs. By spreading casualties over a much broader area and among relatively isolated populations, the Kremlin can mask the war's impact on Russia's people. No one bats an eye if there are dead bodies returning to isolated villages that often don't even communicate with each other. In contrast, if thousands of people were returning with wounds or in caskets to a place like Moscow, the war's costs would be much more visible and among a more influential part of the country's population. However, the Kremlin's strategy of isolating the war's costs to the fringes of Russian society might be starting to fray. Because of the authoritarian nature of Putin's regime, it's impossible to accurately gauge the true level of public support for the war in the Russian heartland, but evidence suggests it's declining. In October 2023, Russian polling data indicated that 74% of those surveyed would be happy if Putin signed a peace deal. The same poll also indicated that the Russian public was decisively against another wave of mobilization. A different poll indicated that since the start of 2023, public support for the war in Russia has fallen by half. Despite this dwindling support, at the start of December 2023, Putin announced another mobilization, ordering an additional 170,000 troops to the colors. Disproportionate numbers of these new troops will certainly come from Russia's far-flung regions and its poorer and ethnic minority populations. However, the new wave of mobilization is a risk that Putin is willing to take. Putting so much of the war's burdens on the country's ethnic minority populations comes with another potential benefit for the Kremlin. Military service to the Russian state is about the only thing that many of these ethnic groups, especially in far-flung Siberia, share with Moscow and with each other. With the censoring of the internet and alternatives to Russian state media, these poorer and ethnic minority groups often have no access to alternative sources of information, unlike the more affluent Russian population in the European heartland. The result is a forged identity that serves Putin's purpose of assimilating all of these disparate groups into the Russian state, something that the Russian Empire and even the Soviet Union never attempted to do on a uniform basis. Do you think that Putin will succeed in these efforts? What does placing a disproportionate share of the military burden on Russia's poorer and ethnic minority communities mean for the Kremlin's war effort and the future of the country? Don't forget to let us know in the comments. Also, make sure to hit the like button and subscribe to the channel for more military analysis from military experts.